Hi, everyone. My name is Patricia Loria. I'm a senior client engagement lead with the Global CCS Institute. Thank you for our third installment on developing CCUS projects. This time, we're going to be talking about Colorado and Wyoming, and we have a great um, set of speakers lined up. I'll also say you can consider it the holiday edition of developing CCUS projects. Um, hope that you are all kind of gearing up to get some rest and relaxation this holiday season. I know one of the things I'm hoping for for Christmas is some good energy builds to get past this week. So we'll kind of all hope and pray that those come through. Um, but again, thank you so much for joining us. And we do really appreciate your support through this series of events. We wanna thank um, the US Department of Energy, the Office of Fossil Energy and the US Energy Association for their continued support of not only these events, but obviously CCS overall. The US Department of Energy has really been a leader that has allowed the US to lead in new projects globally for CCS. Um, we're gonna have Jeff Erickson sharing the latest of our global status report update. Um, but I think we certainly know that the US is an exciting place for projects right now. And certainly um, there's um, in Colorado and Wyoming, those are great examples of that. We can go to the next slide. Um, for those of you who um, are new to the Zoom control panel, um, it does say mute or unmute, but you as participants are not able to mute or unmute yourself um, with this platform. If you have questions for the panelists throughout, you can add them to the Q&A function. Um, I will share um, those panels where we will be doing question and answer sessions. Um, but even if you have a question, if, if we're not doing a question and answer center, please, please, please feel free to add it and um, we can pass it on to the host if that's appropriate. Um, you can see webinar information, and there's a couple different ways you can view, view the screen. Um, so I would say, um, you know, feel free to play along with, play around with the Zoom controls um, throughout the day. I'm going to go to the next slide. Um, a little bit about the Global CCS Institute, for those who don't know us. We are an international think tank um, whose mission is to advance the deployment of carbon capture, because we believe it's a necessary and incredibly important climate mitigation tool to meet um, the goals of the Paris Climate Change Agreement. We are backed by governments, businesses, and NGOs, and right now we have 83 members and growing. We're in six locations, including our headquarters, which is in Melbourne um, in the United States. We're out of the DC office. I'm working here out of my home in Oakton, Virginia. We also have offices in London, Brussels, Tokyo, and Beijing. We have um, different teams who work across, um, across the organization to provide our basic value proposition. Certainly we do a large amount of education and advocacy and we're excited to use these types of events to continue to share important messages about advancing deployment of CCS. We do a lot of thought leadership reports and intelligence, including our global status of CCS report that just came out um, earlier this month. Jeff will be sharing information about that, but we certainly encourage you to go download that report. I'll be highlighting another report on, on ESG and CCS that we did earlier this year, um, but certainly go to our website to look for all that information and connections. You know, one of the things that we think um, is incredibly important is to get governments, businesses, NGOs, universities all together talking about CCS. I think that's the model that's helped the United States be particularly successful in carbon capture. And it certainly is gonna be reflected in the speakers that you hear from today and tomorrow. You can go on to the next slide. So this gives kind of a snapshot of the agenda. Um, we're gonna start with commitment to decarbonize different states' perspectives. So in this event, we're talking both about both Colorado and Wyoming. They are both um, committed to decarbonization, but certainly have different perspectives. And we have some great speakers there. Then, as I said, Jeff's going to talk about status of CCUS in the US around the world. Um, then we will have Keith Tracy talking about how to utilize 45Q on your CCUS project. Then we'll move on to putting a project together. Um, we'll talk about capture, transportation, and storage um, with a variety um, of individuals from the private um, and university sectors, as well as the public sector. And then we're gonna have um, a new session 
for those of you who have been to some of our other programs in Louisiana and Texas on innovation applications, innovation applications to drive growth. So we'll be talking about hydrogen, biofuels, and more, and we'll have someone from the DOE there. Um, I'll kind of leave day two. We'll talk about that tomorrow morning, but certainly really excited about the two days of programs we have ahead um, and looking forward um, to engaging with you, listening to your questions, and hopefully kind of following up with you on your own CCUS projects going forward. You can go on to the next slide. Um, so as I said, we're going to have two speakers, um, Randall Luthi and Dr. Will Tour. So Randall Luthi is the Chief Energy Advisor for the state of Wyoming. Um, I am really amazed at um, the pedigrees of both of these speakers. They have both been engaged in energy for a number of years. They've had held positions across the private sector, public sector um, agencies. Um, Randall, you know, I, I saw in his bio, it says he's an attorney, a rancher, and the former speaker of the Wyoming House of Representatives. So what more could you ask for? Um, he also worked in the Department of Interior, and so certainly understands a lot about energy in the state of Wyoming. Um, Dr. Will Tor has a similar esteemed background. Um, he has been the mayor of Boulder, but also held a lot of different positions around energy efficiency, air quality control. So I'm excited to hear um, both of their perspectives on decarbonization and how this can help us continue to think through the region and where CCUS can play in that region. So with that, um, I'm gonna start with having um, Randall Luthi um, put on your screen and mic and he has some slides to share. Um, so I will pass over um, kind of the gauntlet to him. And Randall, when you want to move to the next slide, just let us know. Will do. And thank you, Patricia, so much for an opportunity to speak to this group. Uh, it is an honor. And I, and I mentioned to Patricia that I arranged it so that I can give this presentation. Then I have another meeting. Uh, so I'll probably get out of all the hard questions. But I know you have some other great folks in Wyoming. Uh, that uh, will answer them probably better than I do. Uh, so just to begin with, uh, you know, Wyoming is an energy producing state. And, and I apologize for high noon at the CO2 corral, but I, I just couldn't resist. Um, uh, Wyoming is clearly a Western state. We're an energy producing state. And why don't we go to the next slide? Um, and, and one of the reasons I think CCUS will work in Wyoming is because it is Wyoming. You know, we're the nation's leader of coal uh, production. Even today, we're producing about 47% of the nation's thermal coal. Uh, that's a, uh, has been a huge economic blessing to Wyoming for many, many years. Uh, there's, uh, we probably, we paid for about three generations of K through 12 education based upon coal. That's changing, we know it's changing. Uh, but we have, what it means is we have plenty of coal. We also have, uh, uh, enough uh, coal-fired plants in Wyoming that CCUS should be able to really be making a, a difference here. And that's what we exactly plan for it to do. Uh, other reasons why I think it works well for Wyoming, uh, we just were granted our Class 6 uh, well uh, permitting primacy. Uh, we have a lot of poor space that's already been explored. We know that there's a lot available that will work for sequestration. Uh, if we look at EORI, advanced uh, uh, oil recovery. Uh, you, we have, we're also the eighth largest oil and gas producer in the U.S., so it certainly can be used there as well. Uh, the BLM is just finishing up uh, their EIS on the uh, CO2 corridor pipeline, uh, which would, uh, in, in their plan would put a lot of pipeline across the wy Wyoming, uh, reaching various coal fields, also being relatively close to a lot of coal-fired units. So we're well on our way to a transportation system for that as well. Some of you might be aware of the Integrated Test Center. Uh, this was a private uh, public initiative uh, up uh, near G or in Gillette, uh, which actually allows us to uh, use the flue gas from one of the large uh, uh, power plants there uh, for testing, for experimentation, Currently, the X Prize uh, is being one of the X Prize initiatives is being tested there. Uh, we have other space available as well for people to want to start working on their uh, carbon capture uh, tests. And it's the only like facility of it in the United States. 
Um, there's also an economic reason. Uh, as I mentioned, coal has been extremely important to Wyoming, and these coal-fired units are often the major employer for the people of many of the communities in which they are located. Uh, so when you look at that, when you start losing them, you're actually losing jobs, you're likely losing people as well. So there's an economic, uh, uh, I would say, benefit and an incentive that we want to try and make CCS work. And of course, um, we believe 45Q is going to help us do that. Next slide. Uh, policy support for CCUS is very, very strong. Uh, Governor Gordon has been in office for two years. Uh, almost immediately, uh, he uh, announced that without a doubt, we are an all above the energy, uh, all above energy state. Uh, he set forth the goal uh, to, we are gonna be the next state to have a CCUS plant uh, provided. Uh, he has every intention to remain an energy exporter. And one of his favorite sayings is, you know, burning coal is not the issue. It's the release of CO2 that's the issue. Coal remains and is a reliable, reasonably priced, and certainly abundant source of energy. And there's no reason that it can't be part of the solution as we look forward. Uh, CO2 capture, of course, is a high priority for us. And I mentioned that as well, that's we want to be the next state to be a, a, the next CCS unit. And then another thing that helps us, we also have a united federal congressional delegation that really works hard to try and help Wyoming. And that does help when you start talking about uh, funding from the Department of Energy, when you try and get money for feed studies, all that is a plus as we start going, moving forward. Next slide, please. I mentioned the federal legislative, but we also have state supportive as well. Uh, a year ago, uh, the Wyoming legislature passed Senate File 159, which is one somewhat of an unusual idea that said, okay, we understand utilities, you're gonna start selling off these units, but before you do so, you gotta make a good faith effort to try and sell them to somebody that might be able to run them longer. The Wyoming uh, Public Service Commission has just finished the rules on that. Another uh, legislative initiative is the Wyoming Energy Authority. And I believe you have one or two speakers in the next two days from this newly created authority. But it merged our pipeline authority and our infrastructure authority. Uh, it has some bonding capability, but above all, it's going to help coordinate our energy policy. And uh, we're talking now about the transition, but that transition includes using our base fossil fuels like we always have. Uh, it also talks about you know, continuing our strong support for the University of Wyoming the School of Energy Studies and, of course, the Advanced Oil Recovery Institute. Next slide. Go ahead with the next slide. I know oh, you did. I'm sorry. That's how slow I'm watching. The last legislative initiative was HB 200. And as far as we can tell, this is the first of its kind in the nation. Uh, but it actually came out uh, for a coal producing state and it set a limit the amount of CO2 you could produce from a coal fired plant. Uh, it's a 10 year time frame, meaning that the, uh, may, the goal is, it's not a goal, it's a mandate. And it's set 10 years out for 2030. Uh, and it also went further and said utilities, as you go through your IRP process, you now have to consider carbon capture in that, in that process. Uh, it also does a lot of time or has spent some time defining and using the terms reliable and dispatchable. These are the types of power that we want to have available in addition to wind and solar uh, power that is 24 hour power, basically. Uh, the other thing that's a little unusual is that we tasked the Wyoming Public Service Commission with putting together the framework of how to do that. Uh, they've been working on rules. Uh, they've had a couple of hearings on them. So we suspect that the rulemaking will be finished within the next few months. Uh, the bill itself actually does say that utilities could also build or someone else can build a coal fire or a CCUS plant adjacent to the utility. It also has an opportunity that uh, utilities are able to grant a rate of recovery. It's currently limited to 2% unless the PSC decides a better, a different percentage would be appropriate. Uh, there will be a, could have a surcharge and that also allows a return to shareholders 
should be able should they be able to sell the CO2 for other purposes? As I mentioned, the PSC has, has started on the rules. I said it'll be a few months, but I think you'll learn more about that, I believe, tomorrow. So next slide. We do have private support uh, for carbon capture. Uh, the utility company, the major utility, uh, regulated utility company in Wyoming, uh, largely because of HB 200, now has to consider CCUS uh, you know, in their plans. And as they've started their stakeholder meetings, that is indeed there, at least it's talked about, it's in there, it's gonna be discussed. Uh, we have some companies such as Jupiter Oxygen that is uh, completing their feed study. I think it will be ready in February. And it's dealing with one of the units or two of, one or two of the units at the Dave Johnston power plant. Uh, but they'll have that finished early next year. Glen Rock Petroleum is also uh, looking for a use of CO2. Uh, they're particularly interested in EORI, but they're also centering around the Dave Johnston power plant, which is uh, uh, about almost in central Wyoming, but not quite. The other aspect that we are very interested in is we do have some major companies that have made uh, significant, and I do mean significant contributions and guarantees to carbon CO2 removal. Um, those two are Occidental and Microsoft. Uh, both of them have facilities here in Wyoming. Uh, so we're starting a dialogue with them. Well, what else, what else can you do, basically? If you can do it in Norway, why can't you do it in Wyoming? Um, it doesn't come without challenges, as I know all of you know. Uh, frankly, the utility companies are somewhat hesitant about investing in CCUS. Uh, particularly since, uh, you know, most of their studies and the way they've geared the studies find the wind, solar, battery just seems to be a better investment for them at this time. Um, they've also, I think, many of them have used the regional haze decisions of the last, uh, oh, I'd say eight years, uh, where they can either put on new SCR equipment uh, at great expense, or they can shut down. Uh, so you have those two things, I think, uh, making at least some strong headwinds as we try and move forward with CCUS. Uh, I do believe it won't be built without some significant monies from DOE. Uh, that certainly would be feed studies as well as some actual construction dollars. Um, and so because we don't have the private commitment that I, of course, would like to see, but we're hoping that we be coming. 45Q. I think everybody agrees it needs to be extended to really make it helpful. And one of the challenges I think everyone faces, Colorado anywhere, when you're dealing with CCUS, is that many of the NGOs are now, now saying, well, why don't we just skip that step? You know, we really don't need it. Uh, we've got batteries coming on place, wind, solar, and even some are starting to talk about small modular nuclear rather than go the CCUS route. Uh, right now, it's also a very tough time uh, when you're talking about use of CO2 for enhanced oil recovery. Uh, oil prices are low. Uh, when they're low, nobody's really looking to develop more oil. So that's part of the problem. Uh, we also, I think, need some kind of a CO2 market. And oil is one of those markets for EORI or EOR. Uh, but we need more CO2 market possibilities. And I think the biggest uh, challenge is time. It just takes time to put all this together. We may not have the time that we would like. All right. And I think so just to wrap up, I really don't believe that there's a, another state, uh, maybe Colorado can convince me otherwise, but, but I really don't think there's a, another state that is better situated to move forward with CCUS than Wyoming. Uh, in fact, I think it is going to be the only lifeline to some of these coal communities as we start that, uh, that transition. And I think I, I, on just the overall, we need to change the attitude. I believe we're well on our way here in Wyoming to, you know, why do we need it, to why not, and how do we address those challenges? So that's it for my presentation. But Patricia, thank you all very, very much for the opportunity. Randall, thank you so much. I think that really helped kind of set the stage for the day and the conversation. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Will Tor, who will kind of give us um, a perspective from Colorado, which I imagine could be a little bit different. 
Yes, Thanks. ma'am. <laughs> great. Well, thank you very much. And it's great to be here today for this. So what I thought I would do is just describe sort of the broader approach that uh, Colorado is taking on decarbonization. In, in our 2019 legislative session, our legislature for the first time adopted climate goals for the state. They adopted a target of a 50% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions below 2005 levels by 2030 and a 90% reduction by 2050. And along with that, I adopted spe specific language on electric utilities that required our largest utility, Excel Energy, uh, to achieve an 80% emission reduction by 2030 in line with voluntary commitments that the utility had already made and incentivized other utilities uh, to uh, move in the same direction. After the, the passage of that legislation, the, the governor, Governor Polis tasked the energy office to lead an interagency effort and a public process to develop a roadmap to a GHG pollution reduction, to look economy-wide at what it would take to achieve our, our goals and develop a near-term Sort of regulatory and legislative action plan. And we are uh, right in the, the middle of that process or close to the end of that process. We've released a public review draft and are incorporating uh, public feedback right now. We'll be releasing this in early January. But I can, I can give a, a preview of a, a number of the elements. You know, first, we, we very much do see emissions reductions in electricity generation as at the core of our, uh, certainly our near-term action efforts. We, we've seen since the legislation passed in 2019 that there's almost what I would describe as a race to the top among our utilities, where at, at this point, utilities representing close to 95% of fossil generation within the state of Colorado have adopted electric resource plans or will are legally required to file a resource plan within the next few months that would achieve this, that, that achieve at least an 80% emission reduction by 2030. Uh, they're doing this primarily through closing legacy uh, coal plants and re replacing with wind, solar, battery storage, and a uh, small amount of uh, natural gas for capacity backup. What yesterday was actually a pretty exciting day where one of our utilities, Holy Cross Energy, uh, announced plans to achieve a 100% decarbonization by 2030, setting a new bar prior to that. The bar had been set by the Platte River Power Authority who had adopted a, a resource plan about a month ago to achieve a 90% reduction by, by 2030. Um, building on that clean electricity, we have a major focus on electrifying other sectors of the economy with, with you know, significant emphasis on both transportation electrification and electrification of buildings. Um, we've also seen that um, methane emissions from the oil and gas industry are one of our largest sources of greenhouse gases and are in the, the stakeholder process right now for a rulemaking at our state air commission with a goal of achieving a 60% reduction in methane emissions by 2030. So in our ini initial work on the, the roadmap, you know, while we included carbon capture in the modeling and our modeling suggested that it would play a role particularly in the out years, sort of 2030 through 2050, we received significant um, comment on, on the draft, urging us to pay more attention to CCUS in a roadmap. And you know, we've looked at that and we agree with the, the comments that we have received. You know, we we know that there is some active interest in CCUS projects in Colorado. We've are aware, for instance, of the work by uh, the Wholesome Cement Plant in Florence and Oxy Low Carbon Ventures, looking at the potential for 
CCUS at that facility. We've certainly heard of from a number of other companies of interest in CCUS at a number of locations uh, across the state, which has convinced us that it really is a, a nearer term opportunity than, than we'd been seeing in the original roadmap work. I'm anticipating that coming out of, of the roadmap finalization in January that we will be making some um, commitments to move forward on um, CCUS policy development in the state, in which I would anticipate we will be working with a wide variety of stakeholders to both look at you know, what regulatory challenges are there to CCUS projects in Colorado that we, we could smooth the, the way, but also look at you know, what, what role do we really think CCUS will play in uh, achieving the state's uh, greenhouse gas emissions targets. I think as as part of, of that, we'll also be looking at you know, are there incentives or regulatory actions that, that we can take to encourage CCUS where where it's appropriate. You know, I think when when we look at its role in helping to meet Colorado's uh, carbon carbon reduction targets, we probably see it having not as large a role in the electric utility sector, but being very important in some of the hard to decarbonize sectors like um, cement manufacturing, a number of the industrial activities. And certainly as we think about the last 10 or 20% of energy generation, our, our modeling suggests that we can get you know, statewide to something like 85 to 90% a carbon re reduction in electric utilities in a cost-effective way, primarily through wind, solar, and storage, but that that last 10 to 15% is going to need you know, technical innovation, either in things like long duration storage, you know, potentially modular nuclear, but also that potentially you know, uh, things like natural gas generation with carbon capture could play a Play an important role in that. So I think we are trying to approach that question in a technology agnostic fashion and really think, think through how we can set the stage for different technologies to compete to see which is most practical and cost effective going forward. Um, so I would anticipate that in 2021 we will be you know, reaching out to, to stakeholders wanting to really ramp up this conversation about you know where where Colorado should be headed with carbon capture as an element of our broader greenhouse gas emission strategy, and with that, I will uh, throw it back to you. Um, thank you so much, Will. I really appreciate those comments, and I think it um, really points to the versatility of CCUS, um, which we will deal with kind of throughout these two days. I mean, certainly you're going to see some places that need it more for electric power generation than either states or countries will need it. Um, but you know, industrial decarbonization um, certainly is gonna be a place where we think you're gonna see a lot of CCUS. And then as we think about um, in the transportation sector, you know, not necessarily passenger vehicles, but as we start to think about you know, all the different fuels that we'll need to decarbonize transportation, um, I think we'll have some interesting dialogue on that as well. So thank you so much for your comments. We really appreciate it. Um, and thank you for your leadership on um, you know, decarbonization in Colorado. Thank you. Um, our next session will be Jeff Erickson. Um, he'll be speaking about our recent global status of CCS report um, and really excited to kind of get the latest and greatest um, from Jeff on that report. Um, I have gotten a question. We, we will be providing the slides, um, so you don't need to be kind of taking pictures or frantically scribbling as Jeff speaks. Um, we, as I said, we're recording this event. With the recording will be the slides available on our website. Over to you, Jeff. Great. Uh, well, thank you, Patricia, very much. And thank you for both uh, to both Randall and Will for the leadership that you're demonstrating. And um, I I'm keen to see more CCS projects in the region, particularly in Wyoming and Colorado as we go forward. 
And we'll be spending most of the next uh, uh, few hours focusing on Colorado and Wyoming and how to get projects done in those states and in the region in particular. But I'm going to pull back for a few minutes and share with you some of the larger trends and specific activities related to CCS around the world. And the trends and milestones that I'll be discussing, as well as the numbers and charts that I'll be showing you, uh, come from the most recent version of our flagship report, the global status of CCS. And this is a report that we produce each year and publish in December. Typically, we publish it or have a launch event at the COP meeting. But this year, of course, we're not able to do that. So we have a series of virtual events around the world to launch this report. And you can actually find a recording of the first that we did just a couple of weeks ago, focused on a European and a North American audience. You can find that on our website. You can also down the, the, download the report for free from our website. That is Global CCS Institute. Com. So as we look around the world, there's this theme that comes through consistently, and that theme is momentum. You see both public sector and private sector support for and investment in CCS growing in every region. The pipeline of CCS projects that are in development continues to grow, and there are several factors behind that, but one that should not be understated is the increasing number of commitments by both governments and by companies to achieve net zero emissions by mid-century or sooner. And as countries and companies think through how they're going to get there, particularly looking at that last you know, 20% or so, CCS becomes an essential part of that equation. And consistent with that increased level of ambition is increasing policy and funding support for CCS across all of the regions. Uh, major developments in 2020 that we highlighted in the report include the finalization of the rules around the 45Q tax credit in the US, and we'll be doing a deep dive on that uh, as soon as I'm finished here. Um, also, the prominence of hubs and clusters as the preferred operating model for CCS projects around the world, and the emergence of low or zero carbon hydrogen, and that includes hydrogen production coupled with CCS as the fuel of the future. So all of that is great, um, but what's obvious is that we have a huge challenge in front of us. And this is uh, certainly emphasized in the report. If we're to achieve a net zero future, the volume of CO2 captured and stored on an annual basis must be increased by more than 100 times where we are now. As we look at CCS facilities and activity around the world, what we see is an increasing number of facilities in operation and an increasing number in development with North America leading the way in operating facilities and a lot of other activity in various other regions. In Europe, investment has moved beyond the big three countries of Norway, the UK, and the Netherlands, and now includes CCS projects emerging in Denmark, Sweden, Italy, and others. Um, just yesterday, actually, the Norwegian government made the Longship or uh, Langskip project official with its final investment decision that was formalized yesterday by the government of Norway. Um, and that couples with the FIDs that were, uh, that were completed by the private sector. So that project is moving forward. Transboundary ocean, ocean shipments are now allowed under the London Protocol, and that's opening up business opportunities in the region. Activity in the Middle East is being led by the UA and, uh, sorry, the UAE and Saudi Arabia. Saudi has established a circular carbon economy model, which includes reduce, reuse, recycle, and remove. And CCS is an important element of that. And in the UAE, of course, they have the first CCS facility on a steel plant, and they have plant plans to expand um, to include additional uh, CCS facilities on various industrial plants. In China, on the back of President Xi's announcement in September, there's a lot of buzz among government agencies and among businesses about how to get to peak emissions before 2030 and how to get to net zero before 2060. The CCS continues to increase in those conversations as well. And in Japan, uh, Japan's leading efforts for intergovernmental collaboration on CCS across the Asia Pacific region as they explore how complementary capabilities between countries can be leveraged. 
Um, I'll be doing a, a bit of a deep dive on the U.S. in just a minute, but to bring us back to North America, the big headline from north of the border was the commencement of the Alberta Carbon Trunk Line in Alberta. The ACTL employs the hub and cluster model, and it's begun with, a, with CO2 emissions from a refinery and a fertilizer plant, and there's plenty more room in the pipeline to add in additional sources of CO2 in the future. So that was just a quick romp around the world. Let's just take a look at the numbers um, as they relate to CCS development around the world. First, it's important to note that we've updated our classification system. We've eliminated the minimum volume threshold that we did have in place. And instead we're differentiating between commercial facilities and pilots or demonstrations. And as you can see in the blue box, that resulted in six additional commercial facilities. We also now count as separate sources two pairs of facilities, one in Norway and one in the US. We also moved six storage projects out of the facilities database to a storage hubs classification. So we now have 65 total commercial CCS facilities in our, in our database. 26 are operating, three are in construction, 34 are under development, and two have operations suspended. Both of those are in the US, Petronova and Lost Cabin. All told, there were 17 new commercial facilities added in 2020, 12 of which are in the US. And those 65 facilities in total have an annual uh, capture and storage capacity of 115 million tons. We're currently capturing just under 40 million tons per year from those 26 facilities that are in operation. Um, as you can see, the volume of CO2 stored annually, and that's in the red at the bottom of the bars, and the volume of the projects in the pipeline has grown again for the third year in a row, and we don't anticipate any change in that in the years to come. So I mentioned earlier that we're storing about 40 million tons per year. That may be a bit, a bit abstract. So how much is 40 million tons? It's a, about equivalent to the energy used in a year by 4.7 million houses or almost 9 million cars. It's equivalent to the amount of CO2 sequestered by 53 million acres of forest. Um, and Ivanpa, which is one of the largest solar farms in the world in California, and that saves about 400,000 tons per year uh, compared to power generated by a gas-fired power plant. So this is equivalent to about 100 of the largest solar farms in the world. So, that's quite a bit, but it's also only one hundredth of what the International Energy Agency says is necessary to be captured each year by 2050. So we've got a lot of work to do. CCS continues to be a carbon management solution across numerous industries. This uh, chart reflects facilities currently in operation and construction and those in advanced development. The x-axis reflects the start date of the facilities, and up and down the y-axis are the numerous industries. So a couple of things to know here. First is just the number of different industries that are investing in CCS, not just the fossil energy production um, down at the bottom, but also ethanol, waste to energy, iron and steel production, and cement production. The second thing to note here is the number of planned facilities in the power sector, growing from just two to nine, uh, that include seven that are in development uh, currently. Notably, all of those are in the US, though there are uh, several others that are in early development, not reflected on this chart, in Europe and Asia. The third thing to note here is that the US remains the global leader in CCS. We've added 12 new CCS facilities to our database from the US, and that brings the total in the US to 32 facilities that are operating or in the, develop, the development stage, plus the two that are currently idle, and that's about half of the global total. Uh, big news in, in 2020, as I mentioned before, was the finalization of the rules around the 45Q tax credit. The 45Q and the California Low Carbon Fuel Standard have driven a great deal of interest, making the business case feasible for many new projects. And the US Department of Energy continues to provide hundreds of millions of dollars in co-funding support to get potential projects through the early stages of development. 
the CCS projects in development are quite diverse, um, as is the case globally, um, with new projects in the various sectors that I, had been, that I had mentioned previously. I mentioned earlier Petronova as long as as well as Lost Cabin. Um, Petronova garnered and the, and the shutdown garnered a lot of media attention this past year. Uh, you'll probably recall for those of you that have been following CCS for a while that Petronova began its operations in 2016 and it stood out as a real success. The project was built on time and within budget and the capture plant has operated as designed. Uh, it also has a unique business model that includes co-ownership of the West Ranch oil field where the CO2 was injected. And when the oil price went through the floor in March, the economics didn't hold up. And so the owners of Petronova suspended operations. We've reflected that suspension in our number in our numbers and have also reflected the idling of the lost cabin CCS facility due to a fire that occurred a couple of years ago. The CCS facility at Lost Cabin is expected to come back online in the next few months. I mentioned earlier in the presentation, uh, the hubs and clusters is emerging as the preferred operating model for CCS. We've identified 15 such projects around the world that are developing using this model. And as I mentioned, the Alberta Carbon Trunk Line is one um, just north of our backyard that's also using that model. Hubs and clusters capture CO2 from multiple sources that are connected to a transportation and storage network. And they have several advantages over single source, single sink projects. They have access to geology. They can store large volumes of CO2 over decades of injection. Economies of scale deliver lower cost. Risk is reduced because there are multiple sources and sometimes multiple sinks. So the operators aren't dependent on a single facility and resiliency of the system is increased. I want to highlight one hub that's uh, circled here on, on this map, and that's the Northern Lights Hub in Norway. Uh, this is part of the Langskip project. And what's remarkable about this, and, and the um, Northern Lights injection location is shown there in red. What's remarkable, as you can see on the map, is that while the initial operation is getting its CO2 from just two sources, eventually they will expand their transfer net, transportation network across Northern Europe and they've identified about 25 potential sources of CO2 as their future customer base. The last thing I want to share with you before I wrap up is an analysis of the conditions, the policy, market, and physical conditions that enable CCS projects. We looked at all 26 facilities that are operating or in construction, and we plotted out what elements or enabling conditions were in place for each. Um, tax credits, grant funding, carbon tax, EOR, cost of capture, et cetera. And what you can see here in every case is that multiple enabling conditions were present. It wasn't just EOR or grants or tax credit, but multiple elements that were in place. So for you project developers out there, keep that in mind as you're trying to pull together projects and what is it that's going to make it successful. So as we look ahead, we see several trends that we expect to continue for a while. First, an increasing awareness of the serious consequences of climate change and the urgency to act. Closely related to that is the ever increasing number of commitments to net zero emissions. That seems to be increasing by the week. Uh, um, and again, that's both in the public sector with governments, government commitments and the private sector with corporate commitments. The third trend that we expect to continue is ESG, the consideration of environmental social and governance issues by investors. Decarbonization is a significant part of, of that calculus. And of course, CCS is going to play an increasingly important role in decarbonization across numerous sectors. Hydrogen continues to gain traction as the energy carrier of the future. And we see no change in the position of the US as the global CCS leader, as both the private and the public sector demonstrates their ongoing commitment to CCS. And we see several issues that have a whole lot more uncertainty around them and how they play out will certainly impact the pace of CCS deployment. There's the impact of COVID, COVID and the economic crash and recovery and how quickly that recovery and return to normal, whatever that means, will occur. Um, the future of fossil fuels, um, how much longevity does the, interest, does the industry have? How long, will um, they remain an important part of 
both the energy picture and the economic picture around the world and what role will they play in the deployment of CCS. Uh, geopolitics, international cooperation on CCS is essential. And there are currently several relationships that are a bit fraught, I would say, for example, China and the US, China and Australia, just to name two. Will hydrogen be green made with renewables or blue made with fossil fuels and CCS or probably the better question here is to what degree will each contribute to a low carbon economy? And finally, what revenue models for CCS projects will prove to be the most attractive for both governments and project owners? And I think we're just at the beginning of the, that exploration. There's plenty of opportunity for exploration and experimentation and improvement on, on revenue models. So I'm gonna leave you then finally with a list of resources from the Institute and um, leave that up there for just a minute and hand back over to Patricia. Over to you, Patricia, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, I, I know that we've gotten some questions for Jeff. Um, sorry, we don't have um, time for questions right now. He'll look through those um, and answer them um, as time permits, but certainly go to some of these resources, including that webinar recording. Um, and I think you can certainly see some kind of interesting highlights there that might answer some of your questions. Um, we're going to go into our next session on how to utilize 45Q on your CCUS project. And Keith Tracy, a principal with Elysian Ventures is gonna lead that conversation. Um, this is another session where we will not be um, taking questions. We have taken questions after this session at previous events, if you have listened in previously. Um, we do have a breakout session on day two where Keith will be available to answer any questions on 45Q. So if you have questions, we encourage you to do that, um, to participate in that session. But we will actually just keep this session to a half hour. As we go through the rest of the day, we will take questions in both of those afternoon sessions. So certainly we want to make this interactive. Feel free to keep sending questions um, and we can look to see if kind of Keith can actually answer them in the Q&A as well, if they are very, if they're specific to 45Q. But with that, I will um, ask, ask um, Keith to turn on his video and um, we'll start sharing his presentation. Great, <clears throat> thank you, Patricia. Hopefully you can hear me well. It's my pleasure yeah. to be with you all today. Um, I wanna express my appreciation to Global CCS Institute and the US Energy Association, as well as the US Department of Energy for organizing this workshop. I'm joining you from the state of Colorado today, which has uh, wonderful CCS uh, project opportunities as does Wyoming and other places in the West. Uh, I've been in the carbon capture and storage industry for 14 years now. Um, and Elysian Ventures is a company I'm a principal of, and we are a CCS project development company. We have one announced project under a commercial feed study currently that will capture CO2 from a natural gas power plant. <clears throat> and we have many others in the development pipeline, including industrial facilities. In our time together today, our goal is to provide an overview of the Section 45Q tax credit program. Next slide, please. At its highest level, 45Q is a federal tax credit incentive to capture CO2 and then once the CO2 is captured, either utilizing the CO2 to make a product or permanently storing it underground. The incentive is based on physical activity on a per metric ton basis, where you generate more tax credits as more CO2 is captured. For new projects, the credit lasts for 12 years from the date of first capture operations. And as we'll discuss later, the value of the credits are increasing every year. In many ways, 45Q has placed a price on carbon in the US. Next slide, please. I thought it would be helpful up front to provide a sort of checklist of the things that someone would want to think about in order to qualify for 45Q credits. And this checklist will guide the whole presentation today. <clears throat> and this presentation takes into account not only the 2018 amendments to 45Q, but also the beginning of construction notice and the tax equity partnership revenue procedure issued by the IRS in March of this year, as well as the proposed regulations issued in June. So we're gonna talk about what is being captured and how and where it has to be captured. 
We'll also talk about an important deadline for starting construction of a carbon capture project. Then we'll turn to how the CO2 can be stored and under what requirements. Importantly, we'll focus on who gets to claim the tax credit, including someone called tax equity. We'll also briefly discuss the proposed recapture regulations. And we'll clarify things like how much the credit is worth today and in future years and, and wrap up with some additional thoughts. Next slide. So 45Q credits are based on the amount of carbon oxide that is captured. I'm just gonna say CO2 since the vast amount of carbon oxide that's gonna qualify for the credits is CO2. The CO2 must be captured from being emitted into the air or is directly captured from the air by a direct air capture or DAC plant. Now, whether it's a DAC plant or an industrial facility, the CO2 must be measured where it's captured and then that amount of captured CO2 has to be verified where it's stored, whether it's injected or disposed of underground or whether it's utilized to make some product. And there's a special rule there for oil and gas on recycled CO2, there's no credit for recycled CO2. Next slide, please. The CO2 has to be captured using carbon capture equipment. And there's a picture of carbon capture equipment in the background of this slide, it's, it's actually operational today. Carbon capture equipment is a term that's used throughout the statute, but was never defined. The proposed regulations from this summer provided a definition that is nicely broad. Practically any piece of equipment that has anything to do with diverting the CO2 from being emitted uh, will qualify. Uh, the expansive list includes expected pieces of equipment like compressors and dehydrators, but also includes some less expected items such as power generators that might even be owned by other people, or the flue gas duct that feeds the CO2 from the host plant over to the carbon capture island. The list is not quite as the same as the beginning of construction guidance list, but it's close. And we anticipate that the final regulations will harmonize those definitions of carbon capture equipment. In some instances, the proposed regulations indicated that all of the listed items, all the pieces of equipment had to be owned by the same owner, which is really kind of inconsistent with how carbon capture works at many facilities because it's not a, car a cookie cutter approach at every emission point. A lot of commenters uh, encourage the IRS to clarify this point, And uh, we anticipate that that will come when the uh, when the final regulations are proposed are, are issued. Next slide, please. Now that we have carbon capture equipment, we need to know where it can be installed. So it has to be installed at something called a qualified facility. So this is number one, an industrial facility, or number two, a power plant, or number three, a DAC plant. The industrial facility definition is pretty broad. It includes any combustion source of CO2, but also any manufacturing process, which was defined broadly. Uh, the historic exclusion of CO2 production wells was also carried into the, the regulations. Uh, on number two, the power plant, let me make a special note there. The regulations appeared to narrowly define what a power plant was to only those facilities that generate power and sell that power, such as on the grid. As a result, on-site or distributed power plants are not included because they're not selling power. This is helpful because at the bottom of the slide indicates power plants have to capture at least 500,000 metric tons of CO2 a year, but other facilities only have to capture 100,000 metric tons as their annual minimum threshold. The regulations actually allow those minimum thresholds to be annualized. So a carbon capture project that's a minimum size doesn't have to start in January of the year to meet the threshold in the first year. It allows a project to start in August, for example. On the right-hand side is the applicable facility. This is a unique set of circumstances where projects were put in place before 2018, but never claimed the 45Q credits. There's a picture of one provided there they're allowed to claim credits under the new program, the higher credit value program. Next slide, please. So a quick word on direct air capture facilities, which remove CO2 directly from the atmosphere. A DAC plant 
is effect it qualifies for 45Q. It's effectively both the qualified facility as well as the carbon capture equipment. Their annual minimum threshold is 100,000 metric tons a year of CO2 captured. And they have the same requirements to measure and verify the CO2, regardless of how the CO2 is, is stored, whether it's utilized or injected underground. Next slide, please. So now that we know where our carbon capture equipment will be, and we know where to place it in service at a qualified facility, the next question is, when does all this have to be built? So there's two separate timing requirements here for 45Q. First, construction has to start sometime before January 1 of 2024. This deadline applies to the qualified facility or the emitter. It also applies to the carbon capture equipment unless a new qualified facility is being built and carbon capture is part of its design, they're just gonna install the equipment later. Okay, so we have to start construction by January of 2024. But what does it mean to start construction? Well, the IRS issued notice 2020-12 earlier this year to explain exactly that. Lengthy document, heavily based on similar guidance regarding wind and solar tax credits that we've had in the US. So for example, as long as certain physical work is accomplished by the deadline, the requirement is met to start construction. And the notice contains a pretty good list of examples of the types of things that will start construction, such as pouring foundations or buying certain equipment, even if that equipment is not physically on site yet. Another way to start construction is financially, and that is to incur at least 5% of the total capital costs of the project. Now, when you're counting up all the capital costs, you have to make sure you include all the possible CapEx including the funding for a feed step. Another important issue is, okay, once construction has started, how long do I have to complete the project and start operations? The general answer is six years, which is more favorable than the four years that the IRS gave to wind energy projects. Next slide, please. So we need to think about where the CO2 is going to be stored. We have two general options to qualify for 45Q tax credits, utilization and secure geologic storage. So first let's talk about utilization, which is defined by the statute as doing something like photosynthesis, like growing algae, or chemically converting the CO2 into some other material or compound, such as the, uh, the project on the right, where the CO2 is converted into making baking soda. And then there's a third, category, kind of a catch-all provision, which basically says the CO2 can be utilized for any other purpose for which a commercial market exists. Uh, that provision got a lot of attention in the public comments to the proposed regulations, uh, and we expect the IRS to provide some additional clarity there. Next slide, please. So continuing with utilization, there's a requirement in 45Q that the amount of CO2 that's stored through utilization or this beneficial use has to be determined on a life cycle analysis. The proposed regulations provided some explanation about the required LCA, such as you have to use the ISO 14044 standard, and the IRS says that you have to have a third party certification. US governmental agency involvement is pretty heavy here, where the DOE is gonna perform a technical review of the life cycle analysis, and then the IRS will approve it after consulting with DOE and the EPA. The proposed regulation stated that a full life cycle analysis is required rather than a gate to gate approach that was advocated by many. But there's still a lot of unanswered questions about life cycle analysis and the uh, utilization provisions in general. And I've listed some of those here at the bottom of the slide. I'll let you review those later at your leisure. Next slide, please. So instead of utilization, there's another option for how the CO2 is gonna be permanently stored for 45Q purposes. And that is we're gonna put it underground in what the statute calls secure geologic storage. Now this can be in many different types of reservoirs or formations, uh, saline aquifers and depleted oil and gas reservoirs are popular choices. When talking about secure geologic storage, 
The 45Q credit program distinguishes between what they call injection and disposal. Injection is where CO2 is, is placed into an oil and gas formation for enhanced oil recovery or enhanced gas recovery. And in the process, the CO2 is permanently stored in the reservoir. And the picture on the right is a CO2 EOR injection well. So that's injection. Disposal, on the other hand, is where CO2 is put underground and is not used for EOR or EGR. Disposal is like a saline aquifer. So these distinctions are important for many reasons. One is, as we'll see later, the 45Q credit value is different for injection versus disposal. Uh, an important an additional distinction that I'll make here is secure geologic storage is demonstrated differently for the two categories. For injection, for EOR purposes, for example, secure geologic storage requires either compliance with some part RR of the EPA greenhouse gas reporting program or compliance with the ISO standard 27916. If it's disposal into a saline aquifer, however, only the subpart RR method is available to show secure geologic storage. And I might mention here that subpart RR requires EPA approval of a monitoring, reporting, and verification plan, an MRV plan. Two have been approved so far for disposal and three have been approved for injection. Uh, under the ISO standard, just a, a note there, a third party qualified engineer or geologist has to provide the certifications that are needed or the IRS has expressly said that they will disallow the 45Q credits. Next slide, please. So now that the carbon capture equipment is placed in service at a qualified facility and the CO2 is being utilized or stored in secure geologic storage, then we need to determine who gets the 45Q credit for all this activity. 45Q credits may be claimed by the owner of the carbon capture equipment. Now the owner is obligated to either physically store the CO2 or the owner can sign a contract and have that contracting party utilize or inject or dispose of the CO2. I'm just gonna call that party Storage Co. So if the owner decides to contract with Storage Co, there has to be this binding written contract between the two. And the IRS proposed regulations impose some limitations on that contract and some of which I've listed here. Um, Storage Co will have to uh, utilize, inject, or dispose of it, and the owner can enforce those obligations. Um, and Storage Co has to you know, comply with all these regulations and comply with all these uh, contract requirements. And, and some of the contract information has to be reported to the IRS. So to be clear, the owner of the carbon capture equipment gets to claim the 45Q credit and they can physically dispose of it or they can contract that. But the owner of the carbon capture equipment has a unique ability that's not found in any other federal tax program. And it's this, the owner has the ability to transfer the tax credit to the storage code that we talked about. The IRS calls that the credit claim storage code. So the owner can make this election to transfer it. They can transfer some or all the tax credits they can transfer it to multiple credit claimants. There's a lot of flexibility here. Those elections can be made every year. So this is a big topic uh, of, of how this, uh, of how the credits work and who gets the tax credits. Now there's one other big topic on who gets to claim the tax credits. That's the next slide. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm not gonna cover everything on this slide, but what I, I wanna introduce you to tax equity. So 45Q is a very significant tax credit and tax credits work only to offset tax liabilities. In some instances that we're gonna have a lot of tax credits on a project. So for example, a million metric ton project in 2026 is gonna generate $50 million in tax credits for disposal just in that year. Well, many carbon capture projects don't involve parties who have a tax liability of $50 million in a year. But there are some taxpayers who do have that uh, kind of appetite for tax credits. And when they invest in carbon capture projects like this to receive an allocation of the tax credits, they're called tax equity. The IRS recognizes this commercial reality as with other tax credits in the past, 
the IRS issued a revenue procedure and explains the rules, if you will, for how a tax equity investor can make this kind of investment. A couple of examples. The investor has to pay at least 20% of their total investment up front. Half, at least half of their investment cannot be contingent, has to be committed. The IRS has provided some favorable provisions, such as excluding operational costs when you think about that 50% pay go. Uh, the revenue procedure says you can have take or pay contracts or supplier pay contract provisions. There's a lot more detail that your tax lawyer would probably be happy to explain to you. But the big takeaway here is that the IRS has provided pretty clear guidance on how these tax equity partnerships can be structured and the tax equity investor takes on the risk of those structures. And this guidance was one of the biggest things that tax equity market was waiting for in order to enter into the 45Q credit business. Uh, and so it's been very helpful. Next slide, please. Since 2008, the 45Q statute said the IRS had to adopt statutes to explain when and how they might recapture these tax credits or disallow these tax credits in the event that the injected CO2 or the disposed of CO2 was to somehow leak. Now I wanna start this discussion on recapture with just a couple of facts. A large major CO2 EOR company with decades of experience in carbon capturing storage has publicly said that their storage ratio exceeds 99%. The amount that was not stored is not because it leaked from the reservoir, but because of just operational upset conditions that just happened in operations. A smaller CO2 EOR company recently released their information over a decade of operations, and their storage percentage was in excess of 99.9%, .9 with none of it leaking from the reservoir. So this is consistent with the general experience that we've had in the EOR industry for 50 years. And those with disposal operations in saline aquifers, they're not having any reservoir leakage either. The second thing I wanna point out on this slide is the italicized part in the middle. I call this the current year offset principle because the regulations say that there's no potential for recapture of these credits, this, this disallowance of credits, uh, unless the amount of CO2 that leaked from the reservoir exceeds the amount that was injected that year. Well, based on the track record we've had in the EOR industry in the last 50 years, including what we've seen here in Colorado and Wyoming, if this recapture rule had been around, there would never be a recapture event because we've never had that instance. If there was somehow a recapture event, the IRS will take a last in first down approach to recapture the tax credits and they will only look back up to five years from the date of the last injection, unless the MRV plan allows a shorter time period. Next slide, please. You all are probably very familiar with the value of the 45Q tax credits, but they are about $20 a metric ton today for injection into EOR or EGR, and almost $32 per metric ton for disposal into saline aquifer. Those numbers climb over the next five years to 35 and $50 a metric ton. And then after 2027, those amounts are adjusted based on inflation. So some examples are shown at the bottom where a 100,000 metric ton per year project, if it began next year, would generate between 40 and $60 million in tax credits over the 12 year period. And that's a minimum sized industrial facility or DAC plant project. A minimum, a minimum size power plant project would generate about 200 million or more in total tax credits. Next slide, please. A brief word here just about the older facilities that existed uh, before 2018. Those facilities can install additional carbon capture equipment and qualify for the new credit values in limited circumstances. Also an older credit, older facility can be retrofitted and render it a new project and qualify for the new values. The old credit values sunset once 75 million metric tons have been claimed in the US in the aggregate. And the IRS has issued annual notices every year to report on the status of that. Based on the most recent information, the trend of claims indicates that those old credit values 
are going to sunset at the end of next year. Next slide, please. The proposed regulations contain a number of instances in which the IRS is collecting information about the items we, we discussed, including who claims the credit, who they've contracted with, where the carbon capture equipment is located, where they, and they want to know where the CO2 is going, including the EPA ID information for the storage facility. They want a lot of details even about the transactions with the credit claimants. The very last statement is important. The regulation says that credits won't be allowed if the required information is not timely provided. Uh, so developing a checklist of what has to be reported is going to be very critical. Next slide. As we think about carbon capture and storage projects, there really are a number of potential business partners that are going to be needed on any project. Some of these functions may be internalized, uh, such as at the qualified facility or the emitter company. And 100% of these business partners may not be needed on every single project. But in many instances, a lot of these business partners, if not most of them, are going to be needed in order to bring a full carbon capture project together. Next slide, please. There is some clarity needed on when 45Q rules are applicable. And the purpose of this slide is just kind of to show at different time periods, different sets of rules may be applicable. The proposed regulations, they can be relied upon immediately, um, but they will only, uh, most, for most people, only apply to 2019 and going forward. Uh, the last thing I'll say on the far right, the proposed regulations indicate that the final rules will be effective beginning the year after they're published. So if the final rules come out in 2021, they won't be applicable until 2022. This creates a little bit of a mess to know which rules apply when, but we'll get that sorted out soon. Next slide, please. This slide provides some background on the history of 45Q, if that's interesting to you. It talks about how it was first introduced, a minor amendment in 2009, and then the 2018 amendments that have significantly spurred on the activity that we're seeing in the market. Uh, next slide, please. This slide takes a quick look at some legislative proposals from last year and this year uh, to amend 45Q. The first set of proposals on, are focused on what some people call direct pay, but it's really a more efficient use of the tax credit. So if enacted, this would treat the 45Q credit as a payment of estimated tax. So if the owner of the carbon capture equipment would receive essentially a refund from the amount of credit instead of having a credit against taxes owed. Some of the bills apply a discount for direct pay, but the most recent ones are at the 100% level. Another significant proposal that's gaining some traction is a bill to eliminate the annual minimum thresholds. This would level the playing field for all carbon capture and storage projects, regardless of their size. A third category of bills are focused on extending that January 1, 2024 deadline to begin construction. The bills last year that were, that were introduced last year proposed a one or two year extension, but the more recent bills have a proposed five or 10 year extension. And there's even a Republican House bill that proposes to eliminate that deadline altogether. It will certainly be interesting to see if any changes are made to 45Q in the next two weeks before Congress wraps things up for this year, and, and then to see what a new Congress and a new administration might do beginning in 2021. Next slide, please. And really this last slide is just more of a resource for you in case you wanna see kind of where the major 45Q topics are mentioned in the statute or in the proposed regulations or in the guidance. So really uh, next slide, that kind of wraps things up, Patricia. Um, and I wanted to uh, conclude here at this point and looks like we're right at 2.15. So let me hand the baton back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Keith. And I love when my panelists are so punctual and we kind of stick to time. So according to our agenda, uh, we have a break for 10 minutes. Um, 
for you to stretch your legs, um, let him get some water if you need to. Um, I just wanted to highlight, Keith will be available to answer questions tomorrow in our breakout sessions. I have um, sent through an email that gives instructions for our breakout sessions. So our breakout sessions do take place on Zoom meeting as opposed to Zoom webinar. We do that to allow more interactivity for you to turn on your video, turn on your mic and ask questions to Keith directly. Um, there are instructions in that email as well to update your Zoom info. So please look at that if you have time over the break and update Zoom info so you can choose your breakout session. Um, I would I'd say we also got questions about the presentations. Those will be available on our website. Um, we have a section on kind of events and you can see all previous event recordings there for those who asked questions on that. So you have about 10 minutes and then we'll go on with our next presentation. But thank you, Keith. Um, we'll look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. Hopefully you all had um, the chance to take a break. I'm gonna ask my next group of panelists to come on. And that includes Jason Beggar, who's the Deputy Director of the Wyoming Energy Authority. We heard about that a little bit this morning from Randall. Um, Squat, Scott Quillanon, um, Director of Resources and Communications from the University of Wyoming. And Kevin Lousy, VP and Project Director from Sargent and Lundy. So Jason and Scott, if you wanna put on your video, Maybe they are not quite back from their from the we break. We should be on. Hopefully you can see us. Okay, yep, there I see you now. Okay, yeah. um, great. Um, and then we can actually stop sharing the screen um, and we'll just see all the participants there. And I will start with questions. Um, this will be uh, a session where we will take question and answers at the end of the session. So certainly keep adding your questions throughout. I will look over your questions after I ask a couple of questions um, and we'll pull those from the Q&A and ask the panelists. Um, so hopefully um, we'll get some interesting questions from the panel there. So first I'm gonna start Kevin with you um, and ask you to explain the role of Sergeant and Lundy plays in the carbon capture universe. And then if you can, can walk through the different elements of a project. So capture, transportation, storage, um, and maybe even talk some about the relative costs of each. Um, so for example, what, you know, when we think about a project, what percentage of overall costs are the capture technology versus storage? Um, so I'll throw all that out at you and then um, I, you know, I can kind of prompt some other answers as we go. Sure. Um, so Sergeant Lundy is a engineering company. We're involved in power and heavy industrial, we're 130 year old company. And we've been involved in carbon capture projects for about the last 15 years. Uh, most of that just based on the state of the industry have been development type work, um, feasibility studies, feed studies, uh, projects such as that. Uh, so what, what we typically do is depending on, on who we're working for, whether it be an investor, developer, uh, host site, project owner, uh, kind of figure out what they know about carbon capture. And then depending on, on how much work they've done on their own is kind of where we'll start with our project. We can, we can start with like a really high level screening study where we look at a number of different assets and we figure out the best one uh, that might be the most suitable for, for a carbon capture project. Or if they kind of know already what, what site they want to use, we can look at all the different technologies that we might be able to apply and figure out which one makes the most sense. Or if we've done, or if they've already done all of that, we can kind of proceed right to a, a detailed feed study, figure out the cost of, of installing uh, a carbon capture system on the back end, uh, figure out the cost to transport it and store it, and get an overall cost of capture to kind of compare it to, to what's available in that 45Q tax credit. And uh, to kind of answer that, that last question you asked about the different costs, um, I mean, the, the cost of the on-site carbon capture equipment is, is by far the biggest cost. Um, it's depending on, you know, where it is, it's usually somewhere in the 70% to 90% of the total project cost range with 
with the transport and storage um, being being a little bit, uh, you know, 10 to 30 percent, depending on how much pipeline you have to put in, how much work you have to do either to a sequestration site or an oil field. Um, so it's typically we see the on site being about 70, 70 to 90 percent of the cost. Great. Um, and that is really helpful. Um, but I think kind of despite that cost disparity, certainly the storage side is also really important. Um, and, you know, I think part of that is this is just an emerging market. Um, Jeff talked about, you know, the hope that as we have hub and clusters, emitters can potentially piggyback onto those common sites, but that's certainly still in development. Um, Scott, can you talk a little bit about work that's being done to kind of assess storage sites, particularly in Wyoming, um, and highlighting the Carbon Save Program, and a little bit about why Wyoming is attractive from a geological storage perspective and an EOR perspective as well. Sure. So yeah, Wyoming, there's a lot, there's a lot going on out here. Um, from the University of Wyoming perspective, we take the approach that Sergeant Lundy is doing, where we're looking at screening and high level feasibility, but from a geologic perspective. So we do have the Wyoming Carbon Safe Site. It's located in Northeast Wyoming. Um, we're going through the permitting process now. Um, hopefully over the next three years, we'll have up to seven different locations permitted for um, CO2 storage. It is a stack storage complex. It's got really nice stacked reservoirs and seals. Um, so from a, from a geologic perspective, we're kind of screening the state to make sure we identify where those good reservoirs are, where they lie. We're making sure that those reservoirs have good, strong seals. Those seals are free from fractures and faults, and they're not punched full of holes from oil and gas development over the years. Uh, we're looking for reservoirs that don't have hydrocarbons in them. Um, I think that's a, an idea that is kind of is lost. We don't want to find a perfect reservoir, but then find oil and gas in it. Um, so we're, for the first time ever, we're looking for salt water in these deep reservoirs. And we're looking for areas that are very disconnected from groundwater supplies. So that it's going to be safe and secure storage. Um, can you, some of, some people may not be aware of the concept of stacked storage. Can you explain what that means and kind of highlight why that's important. Um, you know, maybe reference, you know, certainly there's some challenges if your storage actually um, is very broad, meaning you go over a very large land mass because you have to get kind of poor space rights for that and potentially stack, stack storage can help kind of improve and, and be larger storage sites. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the short answer is it reduces your, your overall footprint. But let me explain a little bit more. So you're absolutely right. right. When you put CO2 into a reservoir, it moves out laterally away from the well bore, depending on the formation thickness and, and the permeability. And in some cases, that area of review can be quite large as the CO2 moves out away from the well bore, depending on how much you're putting in. So what we're looking at are areas that are stacked. So you get several reservoir intervals across the geologic column that can be utilized. And if you inject into each one of those equally, you can significantly reduce the size, overall size of your, of your footprint. So that reduces the number of um, landowners you'll have to deal with. That reduces the, um, really it reduces the number of stakeholders tremendously in each one of these projects. Now, in particular, there's a lot of uh, deep geologic storage that is co-located with where they're currently producing oil and gas. So a lot of these fields already have wells in them. They have compression, they have electricity, they have pipeline networks, they're in remote locations, but the oil and gas is produced much higher in the column. So if we go down just a little bit deeper, um, there's good solid geologic storage in those areas. Um, so stack storage can utilize areas that are already seeing that industrial development. Great, thank you. And, and as we talked about, I mean, Jeff brought up this idea of shared sequestration, also known as this hub and cluster model. Um, and I know that the state is thinking about how to support sequestration as a service. Um, potentially, can you talk about why this is important for CCS development? And happy to hear from 
Kevin and Jason as to, you know, your thoughts on this, you know, Kevin, from your perspective, working with companies or emitters as to, you know, what they potentially would look for in terms of shared sequestration or sequestration as a service. And Jason, what the um, Wyoming Energy Authority could be doing to kind of support this model. Sure, I'll, I'll go first. I think, I think my response will be pretty short. Um, so the, the idea of the, the hub and cluster, the, the shared kind of sequestration EOR sites is, is, is really helpful because uh, it, it insulates you against the price of oil and being able to sell your CO2 into an EOR uh, or, or use it for EOR. So having both available allows you to go to be able to kind of divert back and forth between sequestration and EOR so you can take advantage of, of the higher tax credit for sequestration if there's not you know a good EOR opportunity available at the moment uh, such as earlier this year. Yeah and I guess from a Wyoming sort of policy perspective and, and creating that ample environment you know you, you do have to have a good regulatory legal environment to do certain things um, I, I know um, with another project we work on with carbon capture a lot. Um, we, we, we work with some developers um, out in California who are just how easily it is to work with our Department of Environmental Quality, you know, oil and gas conservation commissioners and regular regulators, where there really is this mentality of getting to yes, of course, abide by all the national laws and regulations and things like that. But the, the idea is how to actually get projects developed. And so um, I think you're gonna very uh, help, helpful regulatory environment and supportive uh, administration in Wyoming. But then you also have to start connecting pieces of policy that are, that are somewhat disconnected. You know, our previous speaker talked you know, about 45Q. Well, you know, you got subpart RR, UU, um, you know, when you got an oil and gas link, we're usually regulated by a state oil and gas um, regulatory body as opposed to EPA. You know, you can have all of these bits and islands where it may seem really easy to connect the dots. But as a state, we actually need to find that smooth sort of linkage where, you know, if you do have a common carrier CO2 pipeline, you know, can they carry anthropogenic CO2 versus, you know, that's would be regulated by EPA versus, you know, existing one that's probably regulated by an oil and gas conservation commission. So um, I guess in essence, we don't know all those answers. <laughs> and so that's why we're out there trying to uh, really investigate these things. Um, University of Wyoming has uh, a center that is looking at a lot of these policy and legal concerns and they do an excellent job of really getting the weeds and understanding just that, but, you know, how can we get those, those gaps, I guess, within project development in front of the right people, whether it's regulators or members of Congress or state legis legislators to actually make sure a project can happen. Great, Patricia. and before I certainly wanna talk about pipelines. Oh, Scott, um, I'll just kind of ask a follow-up and you can answer this as sure. well. Um, you know, I know that the state, you know, Randall brought this up, um, is one of the first states to get class six well primacy. You know, can you talk about whether the, you know, how you develop the skills within the state in order to do that work? And I know that we've also talked about potentially pre-permitting work that, that um, you can do both the states and the universities to help really move along this storage kind of complex development. Um, so happy to, Scott, hear your thoughts on kind of the previous question, but you can lead into that as well. Sure. So let me let me start with that one. That that's a great question. So Wyoming is one of two states to have Class Six primacy, um, and if you look at the Class Six permit, it takes a very unique skill set to get through these permits. This is it, and and this is a unique skill set that the state of Wyoming has been developing over the last decade. We do have a research institute here on campus that has been contributing as best as we can to the best practices of those uh, as through the Department of Energy, but also to the EPA. 
So those are skill sets that have been slowly developed over time here in Wyoming. We're lucky to have them. So from a state's perspective, yeah, we are starting to talk about what can be done to help uh, maybe pre-permit or maybe do some of the legwork that needs to be done in order to reduce the project schedules and project budgets for some of these project developers out there that are looking for carbon capture and storage projects. We're in very early discussions with that, um, but it is a uh, interesting idea to me. Um, if you think about what it, uh, there, there's only two active class six permits out there. Um, and so there's really no examples to pull from for how long it's gonna take you to get a class six permit. But we're kind of using the rule of thumb that we're looking at about 36 months, which is a pretty long time, could be a project killer. But what's the longest lead time in those permits? It's really the, the data collection, the geologic modeling, developing those defensible areas of reviews. These are all very technical skills that could be front loaded a little bit to help take the burden off of those permitting processes. Great. Um, going back then to this kind of conversation about pipeline, and certainly that's another place where Wyoming um, does have um, some current advantages as the Denbury Green Core pipeline goes through Wyoming. Um, but certainly I know that the state also has an attractive legislative environment for um, pipeline development. So certainly would love to hear that, but also just interested from others, you know, as we talk about kind of Colorado and other states in the region, I think we know that we're going to have to develop more pipelines to connect all these emitters with possible sinks for CO2, and that could be in the region. It also could be taking it down to the Permian Basin. Um, if you look at Colorado, they have kind of a hub of ethanol facilities, um, kind of in that um, northeastern corridor that borders on both Nebraska and Kansas, and those certainly could be good candidates um, for CCS deployment at somewhat lower cost. So, you know, how do you see pipelines developing? And Jason, what do you think that the state can do to support it there? And Kevin, happy to hear about your thoughts and what you're hearing about kind of pipeline growth and development um, in, you know, throughout the region. Yeah, so one of the challenges that Wyoming has, and then certainly a lot of the states across the West is just our high percentage of federal land ownership. Um, and so for folks who are not familiar with, you know, federally owned minerals and service and, and the process that it takes to interface with them, build across, even sometimes just build next to, it, it's a pretty lengthy NEPA review process that in certain cases, if you look at, um, I look at some of the big transmission projects over the last 10 years trying to get built in Wyoming. And this is going to be a very similar, a pipeline build would be a very similar type of infrastructure process, process or project where you're, you're crossing a lot of area that's going to interface with a lot of different, you know, wildlife habitat and scenic areas and, um, uh, you know, you name it. Um, it can take upwards of 10 years in well over, you know, several hundred millions of dollars to do all of the proper reviews and permits and everything like that. And it uh, makes projects in Wyoming much more complicated and complex as opposed to say a state like Iowa, where it's, you know, a lot of just, it's, it's uh, privately owned where you negotiate the deal out with the landowner and, and you move forward. Um, um, so uh, probably five or six years ago, the state of Wyoming initiated what's called the Wyoming Pipeline Corridor Initiative. And while it doesn't permit any projects, what it does do, it, or the goal of it, is to identify those pathways through the state that really minimize, uh, say, impacts with wildlife. Sage grouse is a, is a huge issue in Wyoming. Um, also steers clear of, you know, certain watersheds and, you know, other sort of environmentally sensitive areas. And the idea is if we can get the Bureau of Land Management to sign off on those corridors, it could cut that permit time in half. So that is one of the actions that 
you know, very proactive actions that the state of Wyoming has taken to try to expedite and speed up those processes because you know we, it is nice to have infrastructure bundled. And once you kind of know where those uh, transportation corridors are, then you can start seeing and thinking about how they relate to those major sources of CO2, whether it's a power plant or gas plant or whatever, versus those places you'll put it, you know, oil and gas fields, um, the, the geologic sites that Scott's group is looking at and elsewhere. So um, it, it is challenging in the West, but uh, the state has been very proactive in looking at those ways to, to, to uh, build projects. Great. And Kevin, do you want to share thoughts on what you might be hearing throughout the region on pipeline development? Yeah, I'll, so I'll echo what Jason said about permitting. Uh, it's it's <laughs> tough to permit pipelines. It's a lot of work. You got to start early enough. Um, but the good news is there there is a number of programs in the works, uh, carbon the carbon safe program to, to add new pipelines to the region. Um, there's a pretty good existing network of CO2 pipelines. I, I believe it was Jeff earlier who talked about how to, to grow the CCUS business. We're going to have to expand those pipelines significantly. I mean, there are some, some options right now, um, but we're all going to have to expand the CO2 pipelines. Uh, that process is starting. A lot of the carbon safe programs are hooked up with uh, feed studies that are in development. Uh, sorry, carbon capture feed studies that are in development but uh, they can serve more than just that project. They'll be able to serve uh, the entire region. Great, yeah, and certainly, um, you know, I had done in my preamble, certainly hoping for some nice legislature for Christmas this year supporting CCS and that pipeline conversation um, is part of that. Um, Julio Friedman has a nice quote, who is a strong proponent of CCS. Every week should be infrastructure week. Um, and certainly we're hoping for more support for CCS infrastructure. Um, I'm gonna pop into some of the questions or kind of one since it applies to this conversation we're having. Um, and Kevin, it was to you and it was asking, have you heard of projects looking at rails or I guess any alternative to pipelines for moving um, CO2 and if so, what? how does it affect the economics? So uh, most of our experience, the, um, the pure amount of CO2 that we're talking, um, you, you just look at a pipeline, uh, filling a rail car would, it, it, certainly a smaller industrial source, it, it, there, it, might, it might work, but all the projects we've looked at, the amount of CO2 we're talking about, you know, millions of tons per year of CO2, we're, we're looking at putting it into a pipeline. Um, we had someone ask a question about kind of the timeline for class six permits and they were asking about the benefits of class six versus the class two route. Um, Scott, can you kind of talk to, you know, where things have been heading and um, where class two could be used and potentially 45Q and, you know, it's sure. more reliance on class six. Yeah, so the, and that 36 month timeline is just a, a guesstimate of, of what the EPA would take to, to work through it. I, I could be completely off. It's, it's just, a, just a rough guess. Um, and we do hope in Wyoming that that time is cut down considerably with, with the recent grant of primacy. Um, but yes, for, for a class two in Wyoming, that's permitted through the Oil and Gas Commission. That's not permitted through the um, DEQ. Um, and it's, it's something that's done a lot more regularly. So the, the opportunity for if you're doing enhanced gas recovery or enhanced oil recovery and can permit a class two, it's, it's going to be much quicker than a class six. Um. Jason, do you want to talk to, uh, again, I'm looking at questions here before we move on to some conversation on kind of the business case. Um, we're having some questions as to what type of facilities in Wyoming might be attractive for CCS. Um, you know, certainly Randall talked about some of the work that you're doing on power, but I know that there are other facilities that could be um, really attractive for CCS in Wyoming as well. So I don't know if you want to kind of talk through some of those emission sources and I can give kind of some insights from Colorado's perspective as well. Sure, so 
Wyoming is a very rural, wide open state. You know, our total population is less than 600,000 people. So we do not have major industry. You know, our major industries, if you look back historically over the state have been natural resource extraction. And so our major point sources are going to be power plants, refineries. Um, we do have one small ethanol producer. Uh, so, you, you know, that's why our focus is going to be more on the energy and utility sector, just simply because those are our major industries and going to be our major emission sources. Great. Yeah, and you know, certainly, you know, Colorado, we're going to hear from Lafarge Wholesome, who has a cement plant in Colorado that they're looking to put CCS on. There's certainly some more cement plants, natural gas processing, um, some ethanol plants. So, you know, there is some variety there. We're going to go a little bit deeper into that in the next session, but just wanted to kind of introduce here that this, this conversation is certainly beyond power for CCS. But as we look at each state and how they're going to use CCS to decarbonize, it's and, certainly going to depend on And, and if I, would, I might add, a lot of the technology for post-combustion sort of emission control, if you can perfect it on a coal-fired power, power, fire, coal power plant or any sort of you know, emission source like that, there's going to be applications you know, on cement and other industrial sources. So a lot of the technologies do have broader applications above and beyond just emission sources. So I would add, we do have a Trona industry in Southwest Wyoming that is, is unique to Wyoming. And it's one of, it produces a lot of CO2. And we also do have fertilizer plants and cement plants. And uh, we, we focus a lot on coal because coal mining stands up for our economy, but there are a lot of other industries out there looking at starting carbon capture and storage projects. And, and I will add, I will add to what Jason said. I co-sign the these post these post combustion technologies apply. We've done studies all throughout different industries, and they they apply across the board. Great. Um, and you know, again, we might get back to. I know that we have a bunch of questions on kind of pipelines and storage, but I want to move on to kind of a next topic. And if we have time, we'll move back into some of these conversations. Um, and you know, I want to switch gears a bit to kind of the business case for CCS projects and deal structuring. Um, you know, I think Keith gave us some great examples of the fact that there's emitters, but they're not going to be the whole kind of story as we relate to these projects. Um, there's also obviously kind of storage sites, et cetera. Um, you know, I wonder, Jason and Kevin, if you can kind of talk to how, you know, what experience you have with how potentially deals could be being structured and, you know, how that could be affecting, you know, I would say the value of 45Q and whether it's enough to really get these projects going. Well, I, you know, I, I'm, I guess I kind of look at the, the joint venture of the Petronova sort of consortium is probably a good model of what we will see down the road, just because, you know, when you look at, you know, say a fully integrated sort of capture transportation storage EOR project, you know, you, you have major industries with very different skill sets and a lot, and not a lot of overlap. And, you know, EOR, EORI guys are not um, carbon capture, you know, uh, chemical engineers, um, pipeline guys generally don't have a lot of utility experience and, you know, across that board. So um, I, I think you're either going to see a joint venture or you're going to see sort of an industry develop around certain aspects of it. You know, I look at the pipeline network, for example, being looking at it kind of like a utility in, a, a, in an RTO sort of a system where it's sort of shared infrastructure, you know, where you acquire access and then it goes to some sort of end user down the line where, you know, a utility, you know, in Minnesota may put an electron onto the MISO system, 
that is sold to somebody in Missouri it might not be that exact electron that runs through their electric motor down the road, but there's sort of an accounting system. And I think you may see the same thing. Eventually, that's what we'd have to see where, you know, a, a molecule of CO2 may enter the pipeline, say at the Dry Fork Power Station near Gillette, Wyoming, but the molecule that actually gets injected down in the Permian Basin may be a different one as well. Um, and then there also may be a, say, a series of system of credits and, um, you know, a trading of CO2 like you see in energy as well. So, um, you know, right now these early on or these earliest projects are, you know, fully integrated, you know, projects where you control it from one end to the other, but you're probably going to see it eventually broken down into other segments and sectors, in my opinion. Yeah, so I'll, the, what, I'll, what I'll add to that is uh, depending on, so it, I agree with the kind of the, the overall contract structure of, of what the team would look like is it, it's, a, it's a, you want a, as many pieces of the, of the team together in a joint venture as you can for the, exactly the reasons Jason said. And I think that's, as we're doing these feed studies, the people doing the feed study are the same people who, who would be part of the team um, once it once it moved into a project execution phase, and then as as to the the funding, um, the tax credit, which is really the the main or only source of of funding right now, depending on the size of the project, can cover half of the cost, maybe more. You know, depend again, depending on the size, maybe maybe 70, 80 percent, depending on your your existing infrastructure, how close you are to a pipeline, all that good stuff. Um, but, but the tax credit itself is not gonna cover the entire cost of the project. Uh, there does probably need to be additional support um, to, to cover the rest of the cost. Um, and a couple other issues, um, Kevin, for you that, that could affect how these deals are structured or what investors look for. Um, we talked some about things that aren't necessarily always thought of you know, both access to water and power for these projects. You know, why does that matter? And, you know, how does that potentially affect whether a project is viable? Yeah, that's a good, good question. Um, when we do our, any of our studies, screening studies, feasibility studies, uh, there's, there's a few things that are really important. Like these processes are really energy intensive, whether that's in uh, electricity, whether that's steam, if it's steam, you typically need cooling water. So there's, it has a pretty big water requirement as well. So you wanna make sure whatever site you're looking at has the ability to, to provide that energy, whether it be power, steam, or cooling water. And then on the back end, um, you wanna make sure you can do something with the CO2 after you capture it. And there's, there's a reasonable utilization strategy in place. And that, we kind of touched it a few different times, where that can be an existing CO2 pipeline near, near the host site or that can be an upcoming CO2 pipeline, or it can be a sequestration site. So uh, you definitely need to look at those two things. Those, those kind of stand out to me as having the biggest cost on your project, no matter where you do it. Um, and also, can you talk about performance guarantees? Why are they important? Are you seeing more performance guarantees um, in some of these projects? How is that evolving? Yeah, so I think that gets back to the project development and, and having investment interest. Uh, anyone who, who invests in a project like this is going to want some guarantee that they're going to get the amount of CO2 that that they need to, to take advantage of the tax credit and get that get that money back, as well as you're going to get to it on time. Uh, and you're going to start getting that payback as quickly as possible. So when we're doing these, these feed studies and, and development work, we make sure that your process supplier is providing, you know, a, a capture guarantee. We make sure individual equipment suppliers, whether it be big pieces of equipment like your CO2 compressor or smaller pieces of equipment like heat exchangers, are providing equipment guarantees that say their equipment's going to work. And with those two guarantees, you can you could have some um, comfort that you're going to capture the CO2 that you need to make a project viable. And then your engineer and constructor, your your EPC team will usually give you scheduled guarantees to make sure the project's done on time and you start that payback period um, uh, when, when you were promised. 
Great. I'm going to um, go to some of these questions um, that we're receiving. Um, one here asks, um, you mentioned some of the gaps that need to be worked on, including time to get permits for injection and CO2, CO2 disposal wells and pipelines and innovative technology on post-combustion emission controls. What are other kind of big gaps that you see in terms of projects actually coming to fruition? If there was kind of one big problem you could solve, what would it be? Um. I guess the, the, the biggest one that I have seen is, is linking a utility world or major emitters, whether, whether you're a cement plant in the U.S. or a, a utility or, a, you know, anything that emits is going to be governed by the EPA and the Clean Air Act. A lot of your users, your utilization and your pipeline regimes, your enhanced oil recovery regimes, are going to be state law um, uh, un governed under usually an oil and gas regulatory body. So throughout this whole process, one of the concerns we have heard from possible off takers or very likely off takers is that they don't wanna be pulled into an EPA regulatory regime because now all of a sudden their pipeline that has been handling CO2 generated by oil and gas operations are now going to be, you know, if they start receiving um, anthropogenically produced CO2 that people want to capture the 45Q tax credit, they could be all of a sudden pulled in under the EPA regulatory regime. So there is a gap there that needs to be um, fixed. And, and I certainly know through the IRS rules and the 45Q right I mean, people are very aware of that and working on that, but it is a real concern. And, and oil and gas operators are going to have to be very comfortable with that, the fact that they may not, or that they're going to be safe from, say, additional regulations that could sort of just be thrust upon them if they enter into a, um, a new operation that they haven't previously. And then I think the other big gap is. Wyoming about 15 years ago uh, passed a number of laws defining who actually owns the pore space for permanent geologic sequestration. So they, they've updated their land use and property laws to define that. In other states, that, that may not be answered yet. So if you're looking at um, sequestration of any, you know, any sort, is it clearly defined in statute who owns what and therefore who is liable for what? Or would it be going back through sort of common law and practices and things like that? So there may be some additional legal clarifications that need to occur at state levels. And I would just add, I, I think Jason's absolutely right. Everything he identified is kind of the non-technical attributes of CCUS and, and those certainly are, are, are large. From, from the subsurface point of view, it, it takes a long time to get a site characterized and and you just have one site if if we're moving in the direction where we're looking at millions of tons of co2 billions of tons of co2 that need to be stored we need to be able to rapidly characterize the subsurface and, and understand more than just one site we we need we need a much larger understanding of the, maybe the whole state maybe the whole region Um, I'll kind of take a question there, um, take a chance to ask, ask you a question there, Scott. Um, we have had some questions about the safety of geological storage. A um, couple questions on whether, you know, potentially it could cause earthquakes. Um, can you talk to, you know, the experience on um, CO2 storage in the subsurface and what we know about kind of the safety of that? process? Sure. So every, every site is going to have a risk assessment where they're going to identify what risks are out there and how to address them. Uh, one of those large concerns is always induced seismicity. Uh, Wyoming in particular, um, unlike places like Oklahoma and Kansas, uh, doesn't have a long history of induced seismicity. We've injected a lot of produced waters into the subsurface 
and I'm, I'm quoting a study from the Wyoming Geological Survey where they looked at the history of earthquakes, the history of uh, water, produced water injection, and only found two occasions where they could be linked. So this is a region that is, from that perspective, pretty stable. So that risk isn't, isn't very high here in the Rocky Mountain region. The other risk that everybody wants to know about is uh, protecting our groundwater supply wells. Um, so we do that through very uh, specific characterization of those seals to make sure that we don't have uh, legacy well bores that could leak up into the groundwater supply, uh, faults, fractures, those sorts of things to keep that safe. Um, the other risk out there is risk to your minerals. You don't want to inject CO2 and have it go into somebody else's reservoir where they're producing oil and gas from. So there are risks out there and there's, there's ways to address them. And, and we certainly do that on every project. Um, another question here on pipelines. Um, what entity is it federal or state has sitting authority for CO2 pipelines? So Jason, I'm not sure if you can kind of speak to that. I would say it depends. <laughs> um, um, un under a pipeline, you're going to need a slew of permits, and, it, and a lot of it depends. I mean, you're going to need everything from, you know, uh, uh, and, and Kevin and, and Scott. Don't hesitate to jump. And you might even know the exact ones a little bit better than I do, but, but certainly, you know, there's going to be uh, issues under EPA, you know, so uh, Clean Water Drinking Act, you know, making sure that you don't, you know, upset any of the waterways. Um, there's going to be permits regarding probably uh, Army Corps of Engineers, potentially, if you're crossing a major river. Um, uh, there's going to be some wildlife aspects to that as well. And then it depends whether or not the state has primacy in certain areas. So, you know, under a full-fledged multi-state thing, Dakota access pipeline sort of thing, you're gonna have Army Corps of Engineers, you're gonna have BLM, you're gonna have US Fish Wildlife Service, you're gonna have state regulators. It's just, it, it really depends upon the location, the types of environmental interfaces, things like that. Yeah, that, that's a tough question to answer. I, I was, I'm glad you took that, James. You did a good job answering it. I mean, there's, there's a number of permits, and it depends where it is, and it's just, it's complicated. Yeah, it's and that's definitely why a case, a very, case by case. There's case. a very healthy uh, permitting um, legal industry out there to help uh, yep. help people navigate that. So you know, even even the biggest of firms, you know, that do this all the time, they they still hire. Um, experts to help them navigate the permitting process. Um, another question back to security we have is, you know, can carbon ever escape to the atmosphere? And if it can, is there a penalty and who would be liable? So Jason, I don't know if maybe you want to speak to Wyoming's position on liability of CO2 where it sits, um, whether it be the state um, or the company, and certainly um, for those of you who maybe are newer to this space, that does really vary by state. Um, different states have different approaches to um, liability, and some states do take over that liability um, post well closure after a certain number of years. Um, so just FYI, there's a lot of variability there, and I'll say that Colorado hasn't really been a state that's kind of addressed that. Um, whereas Wyoming, you know, certainly has looked at that um, and, you know, certainly happy to hear Scott's perspectives on what are the chances that the carbon escapes to the atmosphere. Um, we also have done some reporting on that and, um, you know, I'm working on some in the California Decarbonization Partnership and we've done some reporting on, I would say, the unlikelihood um, of CO2 escaping post well closure, but you know, I'll let kind of Jason talk and, and Scott and can kind of wrap up on any kind of open other thoughts there too. I, I'm gonna look right at Scott as, <laughs> as, as a carbon safe project. 
they have probably done the most thorough scoping, you know, sort of analysis of the entire world of what a geologic well would look like. And I guess, Scott, if you don't know, that's fine. But I, I don't know if I know well enough to know how exactly sort of. So I, I will take a stab at the unlikelihood of, of escape for CO2. Um, if CO2 is ever going to be putting these reservoirs, we're pretty darn sure that it's going to stay there and it's going to stay there permanently and, and safely. Um, we do look at risk if it leaks and what the, the likelihood of affecting different um, attributes around the system are, like water bodies or oil and gas reservoirs or leakage through this well bore or to a municipal water supply. And we've yet, even though we consider those risks, um, it, it's very, very unlikely that it's ever going to leave the reservoir. Uh, liability is, is something that everybody could, could be addressing a little bit more thoroughly. And we are addressing and providing recommendations in the Carbon Safe Project. Uh, but that's, that's outside of my expertise. And we have, a, we have a professor working just directly on that issue. And that's fine. I know that we're going to touch on this issue of liability um, tomorrow in a session. So if um, you know the person here wants to kind of participate in that session with Lee Beck and Kara Fornstrom, we do have that on the agenda to kind of talk about this liability issue. Um, I will add that again, different states um, have different perspectives as well as federal. I mean, so certainly if it did escape, um, there is requirements to return um, kind of or kind of recapture any credits, whether they be 45Q or I mentioned California, which has the low carbon fuel standard and the CCS protocol so that CCS is eligible for credits um, for transportation fuels there. And um, there's a pretty clear process as to what happens if it escapes. Um, in California, essentially what happens is the corporation has responsibility until 50 years after well closure and then at that point, um, the, the state takes it on, but they do that because you have invested in kind of a buffer account that they can use to pay for those costs as well. So, you know, I would say that this is a conversation that's really ongoing. A lot of states are thinking about it. Um, and certainly, you know, we're looking to provide both information about the permanency of CO2 storage, and we do have a lot of data and modeling that has been done on that, both via the Carbon Safe Program and some other programs, um, but also um, been done kind of around the world, as Jeff has pointed out, you know, there are projects around the world that we can learn from as well. Um, let me look at kind of the questions here. Um, I think there are generally some ones about kind of public acceptance, so public acceptance of pipelines, um, there are concerns over um, potentially pipelines disrupting water. There are some questions here on whether or not um, this activity could have negative impacts or positive impacts for Native Americans. Um, Jason or anyone else, do you want to kind of give your thoughts on, I would say, community acceptance of CCS and how that's changing? Yeah, you know, um, again, Scott's group has done some excellent work regarding um, sort of societal uh, buy-in, that, that social license. But what I can say as a whole in Wyoming is there's very broad acceptance for these types of things. You know, as I mentioned earlier, the, the major sort of industry base within the state tax base is resource extraction. So, um, so many of our citizens are either directly employed or within, you know, one or two businesses sort of removed from those who are directly employed where, you know, they, they understand pipelines, they understand coal mines and transmission lines and just sort of that infrastructure package as a whole. I think the biggest thing is making sure that people are just aware of what's happening and what's going on. But generally, you know, we don't see pickets and protests and those types of things within the state. People go, oh, EOR, CO2 pipelines, we've had that for decades. You know, it's not, it's, it's not that people are not concerned, but I think there's a 
healthy sort of recognition that, hey, we, we've got good laws and regulations in place. And, um, you know, so long as they are followed, uh, th there's no reason to, to just oppose it for the sake of opposing it. So when we started the Carbon Safe Project, our step one, our very first step, uh, we held a public meeting in the public library of Campbell County, which is right next to where we were going to drill our well. And we did it through the Saturday University program. Um, but we invited the community out just to have a conversation about carbon capture and storage. And it was negative 12 degrees outside. It was a snowy February night at seven o'clock. I thought we were going to get three people show up to eat the donuts. Um, but turned out 135 people showed up to this one small room in the library. It was standing room only. Uh, I thought there were going to be pickets and we were going to get carried out and there was a riot, but the whole community showed out just because they were interested in it. It's an extractive community. Coal mining is a way of life. Oil and gas is a way of life. Uh, they're now seeing that carbon capture and storage is a way to keep that way of life going. Um, so there's a lot of community support and, and every carbon capture and storage project should start just that way in the community library of the, of the local community. Thanks. Um, yeah, that's absolutely true. And we've heard that from other projects. I mean, that's not unique to Wyoming, kind of all over. I think right. that's certainly a best practice. Um, another question here is how are landowners structuring leases for CCS injection use on their property. Not sure if anyone has thoughts there. Well, I, I'm not aware of any leases that have been signed by a private landowner with regards to carbon capture, just because we don't have an active geologic capture site. But um, as I mentioned a decade plus ago, 15 years ago, the state of Wyoming did pass those laws that do recognize that unless it has been previously severed, the surface estate owner owns the core space underneath. And so that, um, that storage space can be sold and, and uh, retained like any other uh, ownership interests. But um, the same time as they pass those laws, they looked at laws, basically unitization, um, and, and which is sort of the principle of which uh, like oil and gas production is, is, um, is, is, is governed and then leased. So, you know, if you, somebody puts a well in underneath, you know, it's all considered sort of one geologic block. So uh, the, the way that the leases or the, the industry, I guess, would be structured in Wyoming is very similar to sort of an oil and gas sector where, um, it, you can sign those or lease those rights like you would in oil and gas sort of lease. But also if you say you're the only holdout amongst a broader unit, um, there are ways to sort of compel someone to participate in, in, in a project. We, we are developing, developing some model lease agreements through the Wyoming Carbon Safe Project that will be out in public domain. So that'll help identify what some of that structure might look like. Oh, that's great. Yeah, and, and I would say if you go back to our Louisiana event, um, one of the companies we had there was Gulf Carbon Sequestration. Um, it's kind of a family owned company that has large kind of land resources that they believe would be good for CCS. So they're kind of building that model. So I do think that some of this is gonna develop over time as we see more companies kind of seeing the opportunity um, to do storage as a service, but we're still probably in kind of fairly early stages there. Um, Jason, we had a question, um, and we're gonna talk about this a little bit tomorrow, um, but for people who may not make it, um, and Randall had addressed the Wyoming Integrated Test Center. Do you wanna talk a little bit about what that is um, and potentially how it helps projects um, get done in Wyoming in, by offering kind of this place to test different technologies? Sure. So um, the facility itself is quite simple. Um, it's, it's a 
flue gas delivery system um, where we were able to divert about, about 5% of the power plant's uh, scrub flue gas emissions. So right before it goes up the stack, we diverted into a couple different manifolds to allow test research entities to tie into that and actually test both carbon capture or carbon utilization technologies using real flue gas under the right conditions, temperatures, pressures, all those sorts of things. And the idea is to um, be a site that um, can allow those, those really promising technologies coming out of universities and labs at a small scale to really scale up and uh, you know, under those real world conditions to hopefully give utilities comfort that, uh, that, that they're scalable and, and they can build a commercial scale one. So um, interestingly enough, Kevin was very involved with designing both the power plant and the ITC and um, less than a mile away is Scott's project with the carbon safe project. So, you know, if you want to talk about sort of a cluster um, that could really be, you know, ground zero for a, a fully integrated project. I think you look right there where you, you've got the ability to test a number of different technologies. Um, we, we've got either in, in the pipeline, I guess, you know, membrane technology, solid sorbents, um, potentially some, some solvents, um, as well as, you know, the place to put it. Yeah, with the Scotts project, um, less than 15 miles away is the existing Denbury line that was mentioned. So you could tie in there to move it elsewhere. And then just even in the vicinity around there, you have some, some EOR opportunities. So, you know, we kind of see the ITC as hopefully being kind of a linchpin to develop those post-combustion technologies that can be implemented, not just at that site, but all over. You know, when you look, um, you know, there, there are power plants all over, there's industrial sources all over. You know, if you're talking climate change from a global perspective, it doesn't matter what happens just in the US, you have to have exportable technologies to take to Asia and those places where they're not um, pumping the brakes on, on power plants, you know, they're, they're hitting the gas. So, um, you know, we're pretty excited about what it could lead to, but it does fit in really nicely with uh, some of the other initiatives going on within the state. Well, great. Um, with that, I think we're going to move over um, to our next session. Um, thank you all for the participation. Thanks, Scott, Jason, and Kevin. I think this has been a really interesting conversation. I did just want to highlight, um, I mentioned our breakout sessions tomorrow. So we're going to have Emily Kunkel from Sargent and Lundy, who will do that breakout session. So a lot of the things um, Kevin talked about um, in terms of, you know, how a company like Sargent and Lundy helps you assess different sites, look at different technologies, deal with some of the issues like water and power, she can really get into more questions on. So if you are an emitter who, um, who wants to kind of you know, talk through how you might think about assessing your project, that would be um, a good breakout session for you. But again, Scott, Jason, Kevin, thank you so much. Um, and I'll turn this over to Jeff. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thanks, Patricia. Bye, guys. Great. Uh, so thank you so much to Patricia and all the panelists for sharing their views on, on how to get a project done and, and what are some of the more practical considerations around uh, getting a project done in the region. Um, I'm going to um, now moderate a panel that will uh, take a turn and talk about some of the innovative applications of CCS. So we've been you know, heavy on, on uh, coal-fired power. We've been heavy on oil and gas in sandstone formations. We're going to talk um, a bit of, about hydrogen and the application for, of CCS for hydrogen. We'll talk about biofuels, um, and we'll talk about CCS in type oil formations as well. And we have three very knowledgeable panelists to walk us through that. And um, I'll um, ask them uh, to turn on their videos. Bob, if you could turn on your video, and Jim, if you're out there.
um, <clears throat> but uh, stay muted for the time being. Um, and I'll, I'll just uh, let you know who's on the panel first. So Bob uh, Schreckengust is a senior program manager for advanced turbines, hydrogen and energy, advanced energy materials at the US Department of Energy. And Bob is based in Washington, DC. Ali Kritka is the executive director of the School of Energy Resources at the University of Wyoming in Laramie. And Jim Sorensen is with the Energy and Environmental Research Center, uh, which is part of the University of North Dakota. He's the director of subsurface R&D and he's based in Grand Forks. So uh, I'm not seeing Bob uh, Bob, if you could turn on your video, uh, um, if you're comfortable with that. Otherwise, I'm going to hand it over to Bob. And uh, I know you want you've got uh, several slides to talk to walk through the um, uh, DOE approach to hydrogen, the DOE hydrogen strategy. So, Bob, over to you. Thank you. Well, uh, thanks very much, Jeff. Thanks to the Global CCS Institute for the opportunity to participate today. Um, I have to apologize. I don't have a working webcam. I'm supposed to get a new uh, laptop. It's been delayed three or four times, so I'm stuck with this one for now, so I apologize. Um, so just quick background. I came uh, to DOE from uh, GE Steam Power and before that Alstom Power. Um, I was a boiler R&D program manager there, and, and while I was there, I did have uh, opportunity to spend some time at the uh, Jim Bridger and Dave Johnson station. So somewhat familiar with the uh, coal uh, power landscape out west. Uh, go ahead to the next slide. So just let me start with the bottom line up front. So you can see uh, DOE Fossil Energy published our hydrogen strategy in July of this year. And uh, the overall DOE hydrogen program plan was published in November. Uh, so this is a comprehensive plan for all of DOE. It includes programs and targets for the offices of energy efficiency and renewable energy, nuclear energy, electricity, science, and ARPA-E in addition to uh, fossil energy. So these documents are available at the link shown here. And uh, if you want more information about what I'm gonna touch on, uh, Go there and you can uh, explore this more in depth. Next slide, please. So for fossil energy, this uh, slide kind of represents the four focus areas that we're supporting with research and development funding and are more fully described in our strategy document. Um, we're working to improve gasification of materials such as coal, biomass, and unrecyclable waste plastics with CCUS to produce carbon neutral or carbon negative hydrogen. And then on integration of power generation with hydrogen production, whether by methane reforming or polygeneration. Uh, we have and will continue to work with industry on the use of hydrogen for power generation in hydrogen turbines and solid oxide fuel cells on blending hydrogen with natural gas for firing in existing turbines on any infrastructure needs to support these systems. Um, many of you know that OEMs have turbines that are capable of firing 30 to 50% blends of hydrogen. And our efforts are now focused on developing turbines capable of firing 80% or greater hydrogen on a volume basis. So R&D in this area is focused on micro mixer technology for the combustors. Um, I'm still going through the quick summary. If you go back two slides, please. There you go, thank you. Um, so we're working on uh, firing technology, fuel staging, control knocks, uh, and then uh, optimized cooling flows and cooling geometries to maximize efficiency. Are looking at hydrogen storage, um, including high surface area absorbents, uh, hydrides and liquid carriers, as well as uh, underground storage of hydrogen. Uh, where we're researching utility scale energy storage um, for long term energy storage to meet demand and backup variable get generation on the grid. And then hydrogen transport is really the purview of our office of oil and gas. We're looking at hydrogen pipelines and compressors for large scale transport of hydrogen. Next slide, please. 
I'll touch briefly on uh, on the current status of hydrogen production, but this figure kind of captures the breadth of the DOE hydrogen program plan, including hydrogen production, decarbonization of various industries, including power generation. So in the US, nearly all the 10 million metric tons of hydrogen produced per year are made by reforming a natural gas, but worldwide fossil fuels account for nearly all the 70 million tons of hydrogen produced annually, roughly uh, three quarters by methane reforming of natural gas and 22% by coal gasification. So this shows that H2 can be produced at scale today using fossil-based sources, such as gasification or methane reforming, uh, and the important thing now is to combine both of those with CCUS, because this is a near-term path for increasing production of low-cost hydrogen at the scale needed for meaningful decarbonization of energy use. Uh, the Air Products Project in Port Arthur, Texas, which is one of our major CCUS projects, combines carbon capture with hydrogen production from steam methane reforming, and it's captured over 6 million tons of CO2 to date for use in enhanced oil recovery. So as renewables increase their share of energy generation, these sources can drive electrolyzers to replace or supplement fossil-based hydrogen. Um, we'll need technological advances and economies of scale to reduce the cost of electrolyzer systems and thus the cost of hydrogen produced from renewables. So next slide has a quick look at the cost of hydrogen produced from a, a few of these means that I've been talking about and this illustrates, again, hydrogen from fossil fuels are the lowest cost source of low carbon hydrogen today. Um, the blue line shows the carbon dioxide uh, footprint for per kilogram of hydrogen for each of the four technologies. And the gold boxes show the range of related production costs. So what we're really working at is the third data point for coal biomass gasification with uh, CCS. Um, we're really shooting for carbon negative or carbon neutral hydrogen produced by integrating the use of biomass and or waste plastics with uh, basically with coal or, or other carbon sources. Uh, so right now, uh, those are in the range of $2 a kilogram of hydrogen for the fossil sourced hydrogen, but our, our target in our uh, fossil energy strategy is to get that down to a dollar per kilogram of hydrogen in the future. Next slide, please. So here's a look at uh, some of our gasification and key technology areas that we're looking at um, for, for decarbonization of hydrogen production. Uh, so air separation technologies to reduce the cost of those for, for air, uh, oxygen blown gasification. The coal and biomass use again, uh, with the biomass uh, CCS connection to uh, make carbon negative or carbon neutral hydrogen, and then gas fires for small scale power systems, so modular gas fires to help reduce costs there as well. Uh, these have to be able to accommodate uh, the various feedstocks and their different characteristics of their supply between coal, biomass, uh, waste plastics, and MSW. And we're starting to work on, like I mentioned before, some of these poly generation concepts uh, where you gasify, then can generate electricity, generate hydrogen when the electricity isn't needed. Uh, and then the hydrogen can be used for a lot, of, a lot of different applications, whether it's power generation or an industry. Next slide, please. So for gasification with plastics, our research on our gasification process improvement to reduce the costs includes uh, investigating feedstocks like waste plastics and biomass, uh, ultra high gasifiers that produce hydrogen at pressure, looking at some microwave and laser assisted gasification systems, and then the materials development, including materials for extreme conditions and catalysts to better handle gasification of these blended uh, wastes with coal. Um, these efforts are really to allow the use of low cost localized sources of biomass and waste plastics that'll reduce feedstock costs and again, result in that carbon neutral hydrogen production. Also get some other benefits like reducing landfill burden of non-recyclable plastics and uh, this uh, the, the can provide a sustainable waste to energy option. Next slide, please. 
So here, this is our, uh, like I said, one of our main targets uh, moving forward, uh, focusing on cost effective carbon neutral or carbon negative hydrogen production. So a lot of cost reduction work now is going on with uh, process intensification for the gasification process, modular systems to reduce uh, capital costs and as well as uh, in reducing the cost for integration of the gasification system with the CCUS system. Next slide, please. And finally, uh, trying to link all this production of hydrogen to uh, CCS that we're talking about today. Um, we're looking at uh, leveraging our CCUS experience to apply that to underground hydrogen storage as far as uh, site characterization, hydrogen charging and removal techniques are also under investigation. Um, we're looking at salt domes. You know, there's I think three salt domes operating in the US right now, but they are kind of limited in their geographic availability. So we're also investigating the suitability of other underground storage options, such as uh, depleted oil and gas fields and uh, saline aquifers. Uh, the reason for the interest in large underground storage is uh, for the use of hydrogen as a scale for uh, large scale energy storage for power generation. Uh, we are seeing the first US projects in this area, including uh, the Advanced Clean Energy Storage Project, sometimes called the ACES Project in central Utah, where they're uh, looking at converting a 1,080 megawatt coal station to an 800 megawatt uh, energy storage system with salt cavern hydrogen storage and power generation from hydrogen turbines. Next slide, please. So we also were going to talk a little bit about uh, working with DOE. Um, Randall. Hey, Bob, why don't we leave that there for now? OK, yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. That's kind of what I thought I'd sent those in two pieces because I thought we might use this later. So that's yeah. That's so we'll, for me. We'll, we'll come back to that in just a minute. Um, before before we uh, get on to Holly and Jim, I just have a couple of follow up questions there. Um, First of all, you know, I think a lot of this audience is looking at CO2 sequestration uh, in terms of a cost per ton of CO2 because that's, you know, what the economics are based on, 45.2 is based on. Um, how, does, how does the cost of capturing or generating and sequestering CO2 from hydrogen, um, how does that compare to the cost you know, from a 40, from a, a coal-fired power plant or from an ethanol plant, or in fact, you know, what the National Petroleum Council has indicated is, is you know, what is cost-effective and enables investment. Is it competitive with other applications of CCS? It is, it's, it's very similar to the costs for uh, capture from a coal plant, for example, when you're using a, a coal gasification site. Um, Capture from uh, like natural gas reforming is actually a little bit easier. It's a, a much more concentrated stream, so the costs are a little bit lower there. But yeah, you're you're talking about the right range of costs. Great. And then uh, Ben, if you could just put that uh, the last slide that Bob showed with the leveraging the CCUS experience, put that back up for me. Um, so I was on a call last week. And we were talking about actually hydrogen storage subsurface. And one of the comments that was made is that generally uh, storage into a sandstone formation is a one-way trip. In other words, you can put it in, but it's pretty challenging to get it back out. This slide seems to imply that that's not the case. So can you talk a little bit about um, you know, putting hydrogen in depleted aquifers and the ability to pull that back out cost-effectively? as opposed to kind of an open dome, like a salt, salt formation. So that's exactly what this is uh, researching and the means to do that. Some of these you would have to uh, create uh, kind of a lined uh, cavern underground in these areas. Um, but that's, uh, that's actually also in our uh, oil and gas purview. So as far as the technical details on that, I. I really can't comment. I mean, I know there's some biological conversion and there could be sulfur contamination in depleted fields and things like that. But really all those problems that you asked about are exactly what we're researching right now. And uh, 
that's that's down the road. Yeah, you know, right now a, a salt dome is what you want to use, uh, and it's the uh, most economical option for large scale underground storage at this point. Great. But we hope to be able to make you know more options available so that siting a, a large hydrogen storage isn't as difficult in the future. Okay, very good. Great. Well, thank you for that. Um, I'm going to turn now to Holly. Holly, um, Bob just uh, gave us kind of a big picture view of DOE's hydrogen strategy and some of the things that they're working on. Would love for you to, and um, if you could just turn your video on, um, would love for you to talk a bit about how that plays out in Wyoming um, and what the opportunity is for hydrogen with CCS, coupled with CCS in the state and the region. Okay, thanks, Jeff, and thanks for having me, and thanks for GCCSI to for holding this. Um, so really, really appreciate being here. Um, so when you think about um, hydrogen in Wyoming and how it relates to CCUS um, and our CCUS work that's already been in, ongoing, and you've heard about from other speakers, I think there's a lot of complementary aspects. So. Um, and I will just focus on Wyoming during my comments. But um, when you think about um, the fact that the other things that are helping build a CCUS um, portfolio in Wyoming, like a social license to operate, support of state um, government and local communities and, and test sites, like you just heard about with the Wyoming Integrated Test Center. Um, you know, we have supportive utilities. We're working with Black Hills Energy on a, a large demonstration project. Um, and um, a lot of supportive policy framework, both um, including state policies and then class six primacy. And then a lot of research programs focused in the area. So the, my point is we have a good foundation to build on some of these more novel areas like hydrogen. Um, what hydrogen could mean um, for Wyoming, I think is, could be really, really important to, for economic development for the state. Um, I think we have a lot of challenges for uh, building out a hydrogen-based production economy in Wyoming. Um, it's the same challenges we face for other fuels. So, you know, we're very far from our users. So we do in Wyoming have to think a lot about um, how best to transport the CO2. Um, so I think I do think it's a, a major opportunity for Wyoming. And I, I think when we, we think about it, you know, we think about it doing looking at hydrogen hand in hand with our current efforts on CCUS. Obviously, you know, we have some of the most prolific coal reserves in in the world here in Wyoming in the Powder River Basin. Um, and really because of their scale and their depth um, and their accessibility, they're very low cost to mine. So a great fuel resource. We obviously have great natural gas resource as well. And then we're building out the CO2 storage. But we don't want to forget, we're also building out a lot of wind. So, you know, this could be a holistic hydrogen economy that, that incorporates both blue and green hydrogen. So we think there's, there's a lot of opportunity in the state. I would also say, I mean, I think we're all very intrigued by the con concept of subsurface hydrogen storage. And I think that know how that some of the folks you heard talking earlier um, about our CO2 storage program could really help build out um, some expertise on hydrogen storage as well. So I'm a chemical engineer by training, but um, so I'm not a geologist, so I can't say if it'll actually work or not, but, but I haven't been told no way subsurface will work yet outside of salt domes, which we, we kind of know will work. So, um, so Jeff, I think that's kind of my general answer. Do you have anything more specific? No, I think that's a good start and happy to hear more about um, some of the other work that's going on uh, in your programs, other innovation that's occurring at UW, uh, perhaps you, I know you're, you're uh, doing some work on biofuels. Um, tell us a bit about what's going on there. Yeah, so we have a lot, a lot of research programs. So you've already heard from um, some of our folks. So, so Scott Quillinan spoke earlier. He's the director of the Center for Economic Geology Research, which is a part of the School of Energy Resources, which is a part of the University of Wyoming. So um, one small happy family um, here in Wyoming, but. Um, so you've already heard about some of our programs. So I'll skip maybe the carbon storage stuff, but that is actually, you know, the Carbon Safe Project um, adjacent to Dry Fork Power Plant, Basin Electric's Dry Fork Power Plant is, is one of our flagship projects. Um, some other things that we're working on include, um, we are working on with 
partners, um, Black Hills Energy and Southwest Research Institute, EPRI and GE, um, and Sergeant Lundy, we're working on a flameless pressurized oxy combustion um, project. So that's a, a novel combustion cycle um, that could be new type power plant could provide heat. And one of the things that's really interesting that already got touched on here is, it, is that fuel flexibility. When we think about CCUS, it, it would be great to have a lot of fuel flexibility, whether you're talking about hydrogen production or combustion for heat or power, because it does allow you to, to either burn coal, natural gas, or biomass or waste. And once you incorporate incorporate that biomass or waste, you can be carbon negative. So that's a, a pilot scale project at this point. Um, right now it's paper study. We hope to progress into actual construction um, and operation, um, but we have to submit proposal for that. So we'll see that that's one of our other um, flagship projects. We have a lot of other work going on, maybe not as pertinent to the CCUS world um, around things like rare earths and critical minerals. Of course, actually they are important to all energy because they're used in energy systems. So. Um, we do, we're, we're quite broad. And then across the university, we have we have a lot of different expertise. And in, in, I should say the University of Wyoming is land grant university. So um, we are focused on Wyoming specific issues and trying to deliver for the state. And so we hope to continue to do that. And if there's new areas of opportunity like collaboration with hydrogen, we're always very open to that. So let me just follow up with, with your comment about rare earths because that's, that's interesting. Um, is is uh, mining? I, I assume you're talking about mining rare earth minerals out of uncombusted coal. Is that right? It can be. Um, so, for example, in Wyoming, um, we have the Bear Lodge complex. It's it's been named or it's been called um, the largest unmined rare earth element deposit in in um, North America, and um, you know, we're not intricately involved with that, but it is worth stating that that's out there. That is not associated with any other fuel. It's just a, a conventional um, uh, resource. We are also looking at um, how rare earths are co-located with coal seams. And so, um, you know, potentially trying to um, uh, provide additional value to our existing coal seams um, and look at ways to extract the rare earths while the, the coal is also being mined. And it's been, it's interesting um, because the rare earth placement um, in the coal seams is really at the top and the bottom of the coal seam. So it, it's not, it's not mixed in with the coal that you would probably send to power plants. Um, so that actually is pr probably an opportunity. Um, other, other things we're looking at, we do have a project um, collaboration project with um, the Department of Energy and National Energy Technology Lab in Campbell County um, here in Wyoming and the city of Gillette. And we're looking at extracting rare earths from coal ash. And then we have another formation, geologic formation um, in Wyoming, Phosphoria formation um, that, that seems to have some promise as well. So just like hydrogen, we would be all, we're all of the above strategy on rare earths, whatever provides value to the state we're looking at. Great, great, thank you. I'm gonna turn now to Jim Sorensen from EERC. Um, Jim, we were talking a bit about, uh, first of all, hydrogen and, and then some of the other work that Holly's doing at the University of Wyoming. Um, talk a bit about your work. Let's start with your work at EERC with ethanol, CCS on ethanol. And then also um, uh, after we talk about ethanol, let's talk about uh, CCS and tidal oil as well. All right, thanks, Jeff. Uh, yeah, thank, thanks for having me as part of the panel. Uh, really good discussion going here. Um, you know, the EERC, um, let me just give a little bit of background. We, we're all part of the University of North Dakota here in Grand Forks, North Dakota. And uh, one of our flagship programs is something we call the Plain CO2 Reduction Partnership or the PCOR Partnership. And, and through the PCOR Partnership, it's a, it's a consortium of uh, funding from, from the U.S. Department of Energy through National Energy Technology Laboratory. Uh, we've matched that with uh, resources from the state of North Dakota through the Lignite Research Council and the Oil and Gas Research Council. And then we've got over a hundred uh, other partners uh, ranging from, um, from some of the, the companies that own and operate the coal-fired power plants, uh, the major oil producers in the region. And our region, by the way, covers nine states and, and four provinces and up, up, up to Alaska. They really kind of focus on the Northern Plains uh, and the Williston Basin kind of being the center of that. Um, and so we've got a broad range of stakeholders and included in that, uh, we've, we've got a lot of folks 
a lot of ethanol companies, ethanol production companies in the region that have joined the PCOR partnership uh, in order to better understand the opportunities uh, for geological storage of CO2, whether it be in uh, saline, uh, deep saline formations uh, for straight carbon capture and storage or for use in enhanced soil recovery as, as part of you know, CCUS. And so you know, to, to get to your question about the, uh, the ethanol producers, you know, one of the things that we've seen just in the last, uh, I'd say year and a half, two years, is a tremendous increase in the interest in CCS from the ethanol uh, industry. Um, uh, in North Dakota in 2018, uh, was granted primacy for class six wells as, as Wyoming has recently also been granted primacy for class six wells. Um, uh, and then you combine that with the, uh, the 45Q tax credits. And then probably for the ethanol industry, uh, the low carbon fuel standard credits uh, that have, have been established in California and, and also Oregon, uh, those have, have created an economic driver for capturing CO2 from an ethanol plant, which which generates very pure uh, CO2 from the uh, fermentation stream, capturing that CO2 and injecting it into a saline formation for CCS uh, has actually, uh, it looks like there's a pathway now for uh, getting those, those low carbon fuel standard credits associated with California. And you know, that's a significant driver because uh, the market for those ranges anywhere from you know, 150 all the way up to almost $200 a ton uh, for CO2 uh, uh, storage, or for, I'm sorry, for, the, for those credits. And CO2 storage within the last year or so has been recognized by California as a means of, of getting those credits. And uh, they're kind of one of, the, one of the producers, one of the ethanol producers we're working with is in the early stages of going down that pathway and actually getting their, their ethanol recognized as a, as a low carbon fuel, qualifying for those, those credits because of the fact that they'll be uh, looking to do CCS. So, you know, there's a significant mark, uh, driver there uh, in, in terms of those credits. And then if you stack those along with the 45Q tax credits, uh, you're looking at $50 a ton for storage in, in CCS with those credits. It makes a real nice uh, economic driver for CCS associated with the ethanol producers. And you know, I'm sure folks on the call are probably aware, you know, this part of North America, the Dakotas, uh, Nebraska, Iowa, you know, some of the, the largest uh, ethanol producers in, in North America are, are right are right here. So Jim, let me let me stop you there for a minute. Um, so 150 to 200 dollars per ton uh, for CO2 reductions uh, sounds like a no brainer. Uh, what's the catch? What why is everyone not jumping into that market and creating CCS projects? It's, you, you mentioned that you could do projects in in North Dakota and sell the, the product into the California market. Um, what are the requirements to do that? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And, and you know, the, the state of California has, has very, you know, uh, strict requirements on, on what it takes to qualify for those credits. And, you know, uh, the, uh, the D North Dakota Department of Mineral Resources, which is the agency in North Dakota that, that has uh, authority over class six wells and, and CO2 storage in North Dakota, uh, they had to work pretty closely with, with their counterparts in California uh, to, to get across, you know, here's, here's what is required to get a, a permit for CO2 storage in North Dakota. Here's what you need to do in terms of demonstrating that you understand the geological formation into which you're going to be storing the CO2 in terms of security, long-term security, meaning it's going to stay where it is. So you need to understand the seals, the sealing formations. You need to understand all the different uh, uh, legacy well bores that may be in your area of review and understand what kinds of potential they may be for leakage. You know, ideally you choose an area of review that doesn't have any legacy well bores, but you've got to go through a lot of due diligence to demonstrate that you have a, a detailed understanding of the geology and, uh, and the hydrogeology of, of your area. Um, and so, you know, that, that's, that requires uh, in, in the, what we found is it's going to require uh, the drilling of a stratigraphic test well to prove up the geology, both the, the target formation you're going to inject into and the overlying seal formation. Uh, you've got to go through the due diligence of identifying potential legacy well bores. Um, you've got to go through all the, you've got to go through pore space uh, rights. Uh, you've got to secure uh, access to the pore space. Uh, in North Dakota, uh, the 
the, the surface owner is also the owner of the pore space. So you've got to negotiate with, with those folks and you've got to get uh, a minimum of 55% of the pore space in your area of review uh, you know, an, under contract uh, in order to move forward and amalgamate that area for C, uh, CO2 storage purposes. So there's a lot of steps you need to go through in order to do that. Um, you know, there are, uh, one of our partners is, is quite a ways down the road towards doing that. They've, they've drilled their strat test well. Uh, they've, they've done seismic surveys to, to have a, a very detailed understanding of the nature of the subsurface. And uh, they've gone through the, uh, uh, the pore space ownership uh, component of it. And, and they're in the process of, of putting together a, a, a permit application package for CO2 storage in North Dakota. And, and you know, we're, it's looking like you know, that, that package will be submitted sometime in, in 2021. And uh, you know, hopefully within nine months or so of submitting that package, they'll have a permit in hand and be able to start injection and, and start capitalizing on those credits. Very good. Uh, and you mentioned Oregon kind of in passing, they are uh, developing a similar program to the California low carbon fuel standard. What, where, what's the status on that? And when would you expect CCS to be an element of that? Yeah, so uh, my understanding is uh, California and Oregon, um, they use the same approach to uh, determining carbon intensity of, for instance, an ethanol plant. So what you gotta do is you've gotta go through a process by which you determine the carbon, the baseline carbon intensity and, and then from that, you've got to use what you learn about your site to, to put in the calculation how much CO2 you're going to store. And then that gets backed out of your carbon intensity. And then that helps you, that helps understand how much CO2 is actually going to be, uh, uh, you know, removed from the atmosphere or, or prevented from going to the atmosphere. Um, California is, is, is further down the road. They've, they've got a, a pretty detailed um, laid out pathway that you, you need to go through if you want to do that. Uh, my understanding is, is Oregon is, is still in the process of, of really uh, clearly defining what that pathway is. Um, I'm not sure how, how, for, how far behind they are on that, but you know, they do have a, a low carbon fuel standard uh, program in place. And my understanding is they're going through the process of, of getting up to the same level as, as what California is in terms of you know, have an ethanol uh, project that's going to capture and store CO2 being able to apply for, for those credits. Right. Got it. So I'm going to bring uh, Holly and Bob back into the conversation in just a minute. But before we go there, uh, talk about EERC's work in tight oil, where that exists, what it is, how is it different from sandstone formations from both an operational and perhaps a cost standpoint? Sure. Yeah. So uh, the, for those who, who may not be aware, you know, you've got conventional oil reservoirs uh, where you've been doing CO2 enhanced oil recovery since the 1970s. It's a very well understood mature technology. Uh, typically what you do is you'll have a series of injection wells at one end of your field and you inject in sort of a continuous manner what's called a flood. Uh, you may alternate from CO2 to, to water at points, but there's generally, you know, say, you know, for instance, the Weyburn field up in, in Canada into conventional wells, there's a million tons a year going to Weyburn. It's being injected into that field at a, at a relatively reasonably uh, uh, consistent rate. Um, when you look at unconventional reservoirs, and in North Dakota, the, the Bakken formation is, is an example of that. Uh, very prolific producing formation. Right now, about a million barrels a day of oil are produced from the Bakken. And when we talk about an unconventional tight reservoir, it's, it's got very low porosity and permeability, which means you have to drill long horizontal wells and use hydraulically induced fracturing uh, to open up pathways for the oil to flow. So that has been in play now for uh, starting in the mid 2000s, uh, just for the primary stage of development for, for an unconventional oil resource. Uh, there is currently not a, a um, standard commercial approach to doing enhanced oil recovery in these tight unconventional oil formations. So uh, unlike the conventional uh, enhanced oil recovery projects, which have a very mature technology, we understand the mechanisms, uh, we understand how they operate and then the economics behind them. Uh, the unconventional resource game is, is so new, you know, about 15 years uh, that, that there's a, a lack of understanding in, in how you would go about doing enhanced oil recovery, which means there's a lack of understanding in terms of what kinds of injection rates you're gonna need, what kinds of volumes of CO2 you're gonna need. So it's a very immature technology. 
Um, there has been success using uh, rich gas uh, for enhancement recovery in a, an unconventional tight formation down in Texas. Um, and I think there's a lot of reason to believe that success using rich gas in an unconventional technology will translate to success using CO2. But we're very early in, in that game and uh, the, the details need to be figured out. So, you know, I would say that we're probably anywhere from five to 10 years away from widespread deployment of CO2 enhanced soil recovery in those unconventional reservoirs. Great, really helpful. So I, I wanna turn the conversation to cost then. Um, and Bob, I'm gonna um, ask you to answer my first question and then kind of broaden it out for both Jim and Holly. Uh, and, and this is one of the questions that came through uh, in the Q&A. The question is essentially, how does the cost of hydrogen compare to the cost of natural gas and kind of if we look at it in terms of decarbonized natural gas versus decarbonized hydrogen. Um, tell us about the comparative economics of hydrogen um, and natural gas. So basically, um, if your hydrogen costs a dollar per kilogram, uh, the equivalent cost, uh, you know, energy and natural gas cost would be uh, like $17.60 cents roughly per million BTU for natural gas. Um, so right now, uh, gray hydrogen's being produced around, I'm sorry, for $1, it's 775. So I jumped ahead to what, what it currently is. So it's not quite as horrifying, um, but so uh, gray hydrogen right now is just under $2 a kilogram in the US, highly dependent on natural gas costs. Um, and that's the one that's equivalent to about uh, just under you know, 1650 or so per million BTU natural gas. So there's a lot of work to be done on CapEx reduction, um, you know, better, uh, better catalysts, more cost-effective catalysts uh, to improve process uh, uh, yields and, and lower, lower process costs as well. But yeah, that's the... That's our target is a dollar a kilogram, which is still expensive compared to natural gas. But when you get into uh, world economies um, and the opportunity for US to maybe export hydrogen, then, then it looks, uh, the economics look a little bit better. Great, and, and what is the, what's the pace at which that cost is gonna come down? Uh, good question. Um, well, there's a lot of targets to achieve a lot of this by 2030 and for it to actually happen there needs to be a, an economic case to be made to to get to that goal in 2030 so so i would say our cost target has to be achieved by roughly that same time frame of 2030 to to make it economical great um, Holly, and then, and then Jim, uh, if you can talk about the comparative economics uh, on some of the alternatives that you're working on um, and what you expect to happen with the economics as you go forward. Holly, you want to talk just talking about ethanol? Sorry, me first? Yeah, if you would. Okay. And you're referring to economics of exactly what? Uh, well, the cost of, of um, CCS on ethanol hydrogen. compared to uh, oh. hydrogen or, or, yeah, or coal-fired power. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, well, so we don't, we got left out of the, the, we're not part of the corn ethanol game, unfortunately. Um, Jim point was right that it's more of a Midwest phenomenon. We do, mm -hmm. I feel like we have some, some space to use biomass um, particularly with forest health, but again, you, you're, you have to break that cost gap and that that is not a challenge that's been solved you know so potentially um uh mitigating forest fires through maintaining forest health by removing uh high-risk biomass that has a that can have a really low carbon footprint that's very expensive but i that, that wasn't really your question but i did think it's worth mentioning um that there are some some opportunities out there that where there there can be externalities and additional benefits that aren't quite being explored yet um as far as costs, I mean, we totally agree. I think, you know, you just have to take it one step at a time. So one of the things we haven't talked about um, that is worth mentioning is that um, 
most likely you're going to need to look at life cycle emissions. Um, and so, you know, we do have producers in this part of the world and in Wyoming that um, are, are already reducing their upstream methane emissions. And um, they are generally offering a different product, right? Because they've already, they've gotten third party um, certification that their upstream met methane emissions are lower, but that right now there's not a market for that. So um, it's just, you know, you take it one more step and you can do student methane reforming with CCS. Um, you know, that's been, that technology has been around a long time. Um, one of the things that we're working on that I hadn't mentioned yet is a dry methane reforming catalyst. So you could, um, you take methane or actual gas and, and CO2 from um, a, a CCUS project potentially. And um, over a catalyst, you can combine them and, and break that down to um, carbon monoxide and hydrogen. We are, it's, it's very early stage technology, but we do believe the economics are going to be favorable compared to steam methane reforming, at least that's our goal. Um, but, you know, it's with all of these technologies, we, you have to go down the cost buy down curves and some of this stuff is more early stage. But I still, I still would reiterate that, that the work that's being done on CCUS more broadly is going to benefit um, hydrogen as well because that CO2 storage step is non-trivial, even in states like North Dakota and Wyoming where we do have class six primacy. So um, bringing the cost down associated with that is also gonna help these projects. Jim, your view? Uh, well, um, I think, uh, you know, one thing, um, just from, from an economic standpoint, you know, one thing I, I think is worth mentioning, at least in North Dakota, you know, there's the, the, the near-term drivers are, are the, the low carbon fuel centers for the ethanol folks. Um, but you, you brought up the enhanced soil recovery in, in the Bakken. Um, you know, as I mentioned, it's probably five to 10 years away. But I really do believe that industry is going to figure it out. Um, I'm, I'm part of a lot of projects that are focused on that. Uh, progress is getting made in that, in that direction. And when we talk about in terms of just the Bakken itself, uh, the, the prize to be had for successful implementation of CO2 EOR in the Bakken is, is going to be measured in, in, in billions of barrels of incremental oil. So I think within, you know, within five to 10 years, that's going to be the economic driver in, in this part of the country uh, for capturing CO2. And, and there will be that marketplace for, uh, you know, for CO2 in the enhanced oil recovery world. So I think that's something to kind of keep in mind. It's sort of there's these near, near term market drivers, but then there's the long term drivers as well. Right. Good. And hey, how yeah, you mentioned bio. Can I just make one more comment on costs? I, uh, yeah. I mean, when we're talking about uh, the costs for decarbonizing natural gas, the most economic option today is to do CCUS on natural gas combined cycle plants. I mean, it's very hard to compete with that. Um, and natural gas is the easy feedstock to make hydrogen, but being able to utilize the lower cost feedstocks like coal biomass, that, that's another thing that's going to help drive costs down for hydrogen. We got have to get away from using like a natural gas to make hydrogen and use some of these cheaper feedstocks. Thanks. Yeah, so let me let me go there next. Um, Holly, you mentioned biomass and um, using uh, waste wood, if you will, from well-managed forests. Uh, so Drax over in the UK has converted a very large coal-fired power plant. They're kind of in the, in the midst of converting that to biofuels. They're combining that with CCS and they'll end up with net negative um, power generation. Uh, are, um, are any of your programs addressing that issue and, and trying to figure out how to utilize biomass um, in power production combined with CCS to get to net negative? So that's a great question. I think honestly the answer is no, but we should be. I would say that like the flameless pressurized oxy combustion technology I talked about earlier, it's definitely designed for fuel flexibility. I think it is one of the challenges with some of these programs though, um, is that they're focused on a specific fuel. And so you don't get to test on a lot of different fuels, even if the technology has that capability. Um, so I think um, under our cor current um, research portfolio, we're not, we're not working in the space as much as um, we really should be, honestly, but I think it, it is a huge opportunity. You think about um, the potential to to have um, carbon negative options um, at a lower cost. You, we really don't want to leave that on the table. So, I will, I will, I will get to work on that, Jeff. But yeah, we're not working on it so much now. <laughs> 
If, if I could jump in, uh, the ERC actually right now is doing a project uh, with funding from National Energy Technology Laboratory uh, to, to look at uh, uh, coal firing, uh, coal, lignite coal with uh, corn stover. Uh, and, and, you know, as we can understand that process, that would certainly then also tie into understanding how you can capture the CO2 from that process as well. But yeah, we're, we're actively doing some uh, pilot plant uh, gasification uh, studies on, on that very concept. Great, and and Bob, any uh, do you know anything about what's going on with the DOE with respect to uh, biomass um, and co-firing at co-fired power plant, plants and or uh, combining that with CCS? So yeah, that was the slide we stopped on. Actually, is uh, two awards that we uh, recently made uh, for exactly that. Um, well, why don't we come back to that, um, Ben? Do you want to pull up uh, uh, pull up that? Uh, Next slide, I think it's slide 63. So these were uh, awards that we announced a month or so ago. Um, so we have two feed studies we've awarded for uh, poly generation systems. And so these are feed studies uh, for two different existing fossil assets to determine the designs and costs uh, for integration of the gasification of coal and biomass to generate the hydrogen that's carbon neutral or carbon negative. So we got roughly $40 million in DOE funds in these two projects. Uh, the first one I think might even uh, be what uh, was spoken about before. Uh, where EPRI is uh, working with the Nebraska Public Power District for a feed study on coal and biomass to produce hydrogen with net negative carbon footprint. And uh, we're looking at corn stover primarily there and some, and you said NETL's funding. So I think, I think we're talking about the same project here. Um, and then Wabash Valley Resources, they have an existing gasification site in Indiana, and uh, we award them a design study to redevelop this gasification site into a fossil power plant for fuel flexible gasification based carbon negative power and hydrogen co production. And again, looking at locally available agricultural wastes as uh, the bly mass as well as waste plastic. And then this one, uh, CO2 will be stored in saline aquifers. I think the previous project is more looking at EOR for the CO2 use. So, so those are some uh, newly awarded projects that we're working on in that area. Great, and that takes us neatly into kind of the last question for each of the three of you. Um, for the project developers and those that either are or want to be part of project development teams, um, what is it that your organizations can do to support them as they work to deploy CCS in the region. Uh, so Bob, let's start with you. So if you go to my last slide, this is it here as a reference so that we can uh, show, but basically we do, we do funding opportunity announcements and we competitively award uh, research uh, grants for co-funded research in these areas. Um, so what, what we have coming up are, we have a, uh, we're going to be awarding projects on energy storage within the next couple of weeks. Uh, most of those include hydrogen. Um, we, did, we released a funding opportunity announcement for uh, gasification of the blends that we're talking about. Those will probably be awarded in February of next year. But uh, I encourage anyone who's interested in this to, to look at a couple of websites that I have listed, listed here, FedConnect is where all of the fossil energy and many other uh, government agencies, but that's where all of our funding opportunity announcements, requests for information, those type of things are, are released here. Um, if you register an account, you can set up to be uh, automatically notified of uh, releases by you know, fossil energy. And uh, so I encourage people who are interested to, to look at that. Uh, and then, uh, you know, we are, do have an active loan guarantee office that uh, has about eight and a half billion dollars in loan authorizations for advanced fossil energy projects. And so I encourage people to look into that as well. Um, I think uh, some of those CO2 projects that were listed on your uh, table, Jeff, like the Gerald Gentleman plant, uh, pretty sure those include some loan guarantees from DOE. 
Great. And yeah, I mean, I, I think DOE has done a fantastic job of, of closing that gap, um, doing some of that early stage funding to get folks over the line into more commercial opportunities. Um, and I see that continuing. So thanks for that, Bob. Uh, Holly, what can the School of Energy Resources do for developers in the area and how do they access it? Yeah, so um, one of the things that um, hopefully people find and developers find in Wyoming is that we, we do pick up the phone, especially when it comes to CCUS projects. So um, I think that the most meaningful way we, we can help is, um, is by sharing lessons learned from our, our class six permitting work under our carbon safe program. We also have a lot of great geologists here who understand the CO2 storage sites. Um, we, we're obviously developing new technologies and we're happy to, to share that information um, with, with any developers. I mean, we will help in any way we can and that's what we're here to do. And I would just add that it's, it's much more broad than just the School of Energy Resources. You know, it's, it's some of the things I mentioned earlier. It's a supportive state governments. We have the Wyoming Energy Authority who you already heard from. We have the Enhanced Oil Recovery Institute. We have the School of Energy Resources. We have the Wyoming Integrated Test Center. So please know that Wyoming is open for business when it comes to CCUS projects. And we're gonna do everything we can to get steel in the ground and make these um, projects successful and safe and, and operating. Great, thanks Holly. And Jim, um, how can folks access the expertise the EERC has? Yeah, uh, so you know I think that the EERC um, working through the PCOR partnership, which, which we've been managing, uh, we're the primary contractor on that. And that, that program has been in place uh, for 17 years. So, you know, I think what we bring to the table is 17 years of experience in uh, understanding the, the nature of, of the geological uh, uh, formations that are out there that, that uh, are amenable to CO2 storage, uh, understanding the distribution and the nature of the various sources in the region. And, and to that end, you know, we've been a, a part of everything from uh, helping out with the regulatory side of things. Uh, when North Dakota was going through the process to get primacy, uh, the, the EERC was, was uh, providing a lot of technical support to, to the Department of Min uh, Mineral Resources as they stepped through that process. Uh, so we're very familiar with the regulatory framework uh, that's in place to move forward with the CCS project. Uh, we've, uh, we've been instrumental in, in developing and executing projects to, uh, to characterize uh, the geological formations, uh, everything from, from designing and executing uh, stratigraphic test well drilling programs to designing and executing uh, seismic survey collection and processing and pulling that all together into a, 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 you know, really a product that our client can understand and, and uh, get put into a, a, a into a, uh, a package that can then be uh, provided to, to the regulator that's gonna you know, ultimately hopefully issue the permits. Um, and then and, and finally, you know, the EERC has, has a strong track record of, of working with the US Department of Energy and, uh, and other uh, funding sources uh, to pull these projects together in, in the early stages. Uh, but we also have a, a track record in, in working in the commercial space as well uh, for those who want to do a strictly commercial project and, and make these kinds of things happen. And, and I think for those who are interested in, in getting in touch with the EERC, uh, we've got a website, uh, it's, it's uh, eerc.org. Um, and uh, there's also the, the Plain CO2 Reduction Partnership or PCOR. Uh, that, that, uh, if, you, if you Google PCOR Partnership, uh, you'll, you'll be taken straight to that website as well. Great. Well, thank you all. Plenty of great resources to help potential uh, development teams as they're trying to figure out how to get projects done in the region. Um, and that's a great way to cap off the day. A lot of really great information shared today. Tomorrow is part two. Um, and you can use the same link that you use today to participate tomorrow. We'll be starting at 9 a.m. Mountain Time. So that's 10 a.m. Central and 11 a.m. Eastern Time. And we're going to start out with, uh, Patricia mentioned it earlier, uh, she's going to be sharing findings from a report that the Institute provided for DOE on the connection between ESG, Environment, Social, and Governance, um, Investment Decisions, and CCS. And then we'll hear from folks involved in actual projects in the region. Derek Dreyer 
is going to be talking about the Lafarge Wholesome project that's being developed at their Florence, Colorado cement plant. Bryce Freeman from MTR is going to be talking about the Dry Fork Generating Station in Wyoming. And Mark Lessiman, Marcus Le Le Lessiman is going to be talking about the work that's going on at the Wyoming Integrated Test Center, which you heard a bit about earlier today. Then we'll talk about challenges to deployment and strategies to address them. Um, and at the end of the session, we'll have actually the opportunity to split out into three breakouts for a more focused discussion and Q&A. We have um, done this in, in the two previous workshops and it's proven to be a great opportunity for folks to have a more focused and more direct discussion with some of the experts that you've seen on the panel today. And um, so that we'll, we'll finish up the date or the, the session tomorrow with that opportunity to do breakouts. Like I said, um, you can use the same link that you use for today's session. Um, and uh, I'm going to leave it there. It's late here on the East Coast. So thank you all for participating. Look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. Thank you very much.